uh, to use an AeroSim gaming term, a little chat chat um, with Total Rick Co. Uh, again, he, he's the developer of one of my favorite plugins, the Better Pushback plugin. And then we're going to talk about the the PT6. So uh, good morning, Total Rick Co. Good morning to you too, sir. Uh, can we get a just a little quick audio check to make sure that uh, that he sounds okay? Um, his name is Sasho. That's right pronunciation, I hope. Sasho. Yeah, that's Sasho. perfect. Sasho, and uh, Sasho, just gonna just introduce you to the uh, to the crowd here. Um, where are you from? Hey guys, so I'm from Slovakia. Um, by trade, I'm a software engineer. And I work on very boring operating system stuff, but I'm a free time. I'm a simmer. I'm a also a weekend warrior in terms of pilotage. So I am a PPL holder, and I occasionally go out and make the skies a little bit more unsafe <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> so I have a few questions just on that. We on got that a sub crab. Um, we got. Uh... We got another subcribe coming in. There we go. Uh, so, w when you refer to operating systems, like which operating systems are you working on? So, my primary work is concerned with file system implementation, maintenance, and uh, performance work on a operating system that is basically the descendant of Sun's Solaris. And oh, okay. I work on a file system file system called ZFS, which is basically a uh, way to make any computer or any machine give it enterpri enterprise class storage capability. So the ability to construct huge storage pools, manage, uh, manage various features of the file system, export stuff over the network. Uh, basically, it allows you to build a petabyte in a box okay. for very little money. Okay. So... I imagine that the back end of my 3PAR runs on something similar. So, yeah, pretty much. Uh, 3PAR is a competitor in that space to what we do, and uh, they are a proprietary solution. So okay. they. I was just know, thinking they, that they, it was possibly like a, a Unix or Linux based OS behind the 3PAR, but. It probably is. It's really difficult to tell because three par, as far as I know, that they sell a hardware solution that's so pretty much a sell you box. Okay. And it runs it runs something. It runs a blob that yeah. you just load up on there. I just know that um, we had to spend like pretty much the price of a nice new Tesla car to, to add just a few hard drives <laughs> last month. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, but kind of really Really, cool. what what we try to sort of solve so, for everybody. So, uh, a couple questions. So, uh, t um, how, when did you start into aviation and and decide to get your and why did you want to get your PPL? When and why? Um, originally, I was well as a kid. I was into, um, I was into aviation pretty big time, flight simulation, and everything, but never really very uh, seriously. And then I kind of let it go for maybe 10 years. And I picked it up maybe three or four years ago. And I realized, wow, this, this sim flight simulation thing is really advanced. Since my last, um, before that, my last simulation, before I got back into simulation, the, my last simulator was, I think, FS-98. Okay. Um, uh, then I kind of realized, th then I kind of noticed it again about three or four years ago. And I discovered Frugal and all his videos, and I I thought like, wow, this is really pretty pretty far far along. Yeah. So I looked into the space, quickly decided that uh, FSX was kind of dead in the water. Mm -hmm. um, I I'd never really purchased it, and uh, I just went straight went straight to X Plane Ten, and maybe half a year a year after that, I was like, well, I kind of enjoy this. I could do this on a, on weekends. So I decided to go ahead and start training, and a year later, maybe, well, not quite two years ago, I finished my PPL training. Oh, wow. Now, is it, just on average, do you, what would it be for an hourly rate with a, and, well, first off, what plane was your training in? I trained in a D840 Katana, uh, D820 Katana. Okay, the in diamond. A diamond. 
Yep. And what would that uh, go for with a with an instructor like per hour? Is it pretty expensive in Slovakia? With an instructor, it was about let's see, in dollars it'd be about one hundred and sixty dollars an hour. Okay, so it's pretty comparable to some of the. Yes. Well, it, well, Utah, where I'm from, is we we that, we pay around that per hour with for a skyhawk. Yeah, but yeah, but that's a four seater. The katana is a two seater, and it's basically what I call a washing machine in the sky. Okay, so a skyhawk is going to be. Uh, pushing 200 maybe oh with an I, instructor these, these days these days i finished my training about the last 20 hours i finished on a da40 star uh -huh. and that's the thing i fly these days oh the twin and no 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 da42 would be the twin oh the 40 is twin a, okay 40 yeah and the da40 okay. is a is a one engine okay it's a four series pretty much the size about of a skyhawk okay. um about the same speed same size and also and uh, that one runs with an instructor, about two hundred and sixty dollars an hour. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, aviation in Europe is much more expensive than in the U.S. I think that's. I'm, I was, you know, the other day I was thinking to myself, you know, why, why is does it appear that there's more sim simulation enthusiasts in Europe than there are in the states? And I think part of it has to do with, with that factor: is that the the price of it. <coughs> Is could be, could be cost prohibitive. But anyway, that's pretty cool that you that you got into it. Uh, and and y like you, I I've been well. I started watching Frugal, and uh, I, he was had a video on uh, this FS to crew um, for yep. for FSX uh, and and P3D. And this this was mm -hmm. back in 2013 that I started watching him. And so I went ahead and, yes, I was a P3D fan. <laughs> but before that, I actually started on Microsoft Flight Simulator in 1986. So <laughs> uh, I, I was on version 1 on the Mac in 1986. Wow. And um, I did every version of Microsoft. Soon thereafter, went to the PC side of things and hit every version all the way up. Uh, up until P3D came out, I then converted to P3D, went all the way up to version 3.2, and this was in late in the summer, uh, fall of 2015 is where I was introduced to. I had seen X Plane before, but mm -hmm. I was had two close friends who really showed me what was what, and that's when I made the con the conversion and haven't looked right. back. <laughs> So. My first version of FS Flight Simulator was probably 4.0, or just the one before they switched over to calling it by the year. So 95 was the one, the first one I think they called mm -hmm. in sort of the Windows 95 monitor. And uh, the first one I did was the one just before that. So that must have been like 93-ish. Okay. Yeah. It's good times. Well, that's pretty cool that it led to your training and that you were able to do that. So those of you who have just joined, this is I'm talking to Toto Rico. He is the author of the Better Pushback plugin uh, for X-Plane. Um, he is also uh, working with the with the Flight Factor team with regards to the Airbus A320. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more of detail of that before we start talking about the PT6. But that's who I'm talking to today. His name is uh, Sasho, and on uh, on Twitch here, he's known as uh, Todoriko. So tell us, where did Todoriko come from? Oh, it's uh, it's kind of a joke, jumbling of the name of the one of my favorite movies, which is My Neighbor Totoro. Okay. It's it's Japanese anime anime from I think it's '84. 1984 okay. year I was born, and uh, and yeah, it, it's a really lovely movie, and people just refer to me oftentimes as Totoro. So Totoro, I just kind of, okay. Yeah, so I kind of just played around with it, and it, this uh, this is something that came up. All right, perfect. And, and, and it was basically one of my first go-to names when I was picking. I think a. Uh, uh, I don't. I keep forgetting on which social network it was, but I, I used that name and then kind of got transferred over to YouTube, and from there on, I was like, "Well, let's just use this. I don't care." There you go, uh, Wolf Air. Hello, welcome to the channel. Um, thanks for for being here. Wonder what part of the world uh, you're from, Wolf Air seven three seven. XX Fed up. Uh, hello, good morning. Is the John Fly bot in a weird text color? I'm not sure if I can change the bot color. I probably can. Our Stratman, um, it's a bit fun to read. There you go. Good morning. GPB500, good morning. Uh, Casmatos, we got uh, Kreeth, 
Alex, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, nice to see you guys. Nice to have you here. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, so, you, you do programming for for your job. You, you you got your PPL. You're into the simulation. When and why did you start the Better Pushback plugin project? Ah, uh, so Better Pushback. It's the, the concept of it is pretty old. It's maybe a year, year and a half. Um, originally, it was kind of a Python script where, so my big beef with uh, pushback on Xplane has always been that it's extremely unrealistic to be pushing back and manually controlling it. All the while in the real world, you obviously don't control that from cockpit. Yeah. And at the same time, you will want to be uh, you will want to be uh, focusing on engine start and basically setting up the airplane and everything. So I thought, like, um, why couldn't the computer just do it all for me? Um, there are plug there were plugins that would basically do sort of a pushback for you, but unfortunately, they always required that you um, that you would. Uh, set in a number like how far you want to be pushed back and it's really hard to tell from uh when you are uh when you're at the ramp to really guess how far the lines are and if you want to do anything more complicated then you pretty much host mm. so i just uh hacked together a quick python script about a year and a half ago that just did the absolute minimum of the uh, steering algorithm just to get me roughly where i want to go mm -hmm. and uh and back in the day i was not really comfortable with uh developing explain plugins in C, so I didn't really bother with it. Um, and that really kind of just sat on my hard drive for a pretty long time. A um, while back, uh, I gave it to some YouTubers who occasionally use it, but didn't really do too much. And uh, I then I kind of let that go for a while. Then I got in touch with Flight Factor to develop, to develop uh, start development on some pieces of avionics for their A320 project. And since I was pretty much done with much of my work uh, about two months ago, uh, I thought like, you know, it'd be fun. It'd be fun if I just modernized, better push back a little bit and got it up to where I always wanted it to be, which is sort of a really nicely animated thing where it would pretty much do everything that you would need for pushback and uh, and just, uh, you know, do everything you need for pushback of plugin mm. so you'd be able to go from uh, top down view plan where you want to go it would actually show the tug driving up it would actually lift you up and all those things and uh, yeah that's was that's what better pushback was the initial prototype was done in about two weeks um i used github to track my progress after about two weeks uh flight factor guys okay that it'll be fine if i it'll be okay if i showed it to the world uh, with the A320, uh, so I just did a quick video with that, and uh, yeah, from there on out, some people just found my GitHub repository, and uh, yeah, they downloaded it, they tried it, they liked it, and from there on, it's it's pretty much gone to the state that it's in right now, which is basically just adding features, squashing bugs, and and the, doing the occasional uh, release of a bug fix release, new feature release, whatever. It's right now. Admittedly, it's still kind of unfinished, so there are things that I still want to add. But it's at least to the point where I would say that it's usable for sort of everyday use. And yeah, if, if somebody wants to go, go ahead and give it a go, feel free. Um, yeah, you'll find it on the net. If you just Google it, you'll find it. It's a, it's an amazing plugin. I, I, I applaud you for, for all the work that you've done pretty much for free. Um, going the route of, of the freeware uh, path for, for this and, and many people mm -hmm. and myself included this is this is that phrase that we often use is, is payware quality so thank you for, mm -hmm. for, for making it available for all of us to use um, pretty fascinating stuff and, and, and quite advanced I mean the, to me just the idea of the fact that the aircraft, will rise up into the air that that's some pretty fancy programming right there because like oh, you say there's a lot of really pushback really? plugins uh there's a lot of pushback plugins that will do you know there's a few features that i like like for example i do i did like the ghost with the fly j sim um mm -hmm. but this is takes it one step further and able to you know putting those that that, that orientation of the aircraft in that pre-planning i love that that's taking the ghost to the next step 
Um, you also have incorporated the pushback option for the smaller aircraft, which is, is also amazing. So we're excited to see where it goes and if, um, yeah, pretty good stuff. And and as you can see here in the chat, people love the plugin as yeah. well. I can see that people are cheering, and uh, I hope, uh, yeah, I'm glad I could help that. Um, the reason why I did it uh, in in sort of a freeware fashion that, well, people call it freeware. I come from the sort of old school scene, scene where open source collaboration is really just something we do as a as a given. So we don't really expect to be paid money for it. Um, so the reward for me is that other people are putting in their efforts and uh, I've received uh, tons of contributions for translations, for extra voices, for uh, liveries for the tugs and everything. So I appreciate people's effort in that respect. So it's really more of a collaboration rather than just me giving something away because some, I don't know, I feel like it. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, there's another plugin, by the way, which I did, which are, is probably a little bit less famous because not that many people like it, which would be the RAS plugin, the XRAS thing. Oh, for the runway announcements, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. And that, yeah. <clears throat> that was the first plugin that I did. And by the way, that's the reason why I, uh, why I got in touch with Flight Factor is I basically told them, you know, uh, well, how would you like to have this integrated in your plane? And they were like, "Sure, sounds cool." Pretty receptive. And then, oh yeah, they, that was before the 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 better pushback uh, discussion. Then, and they're like, "Well, we, we, did you did they say, hey, we want that too, or did you say this is available?" Uh, so I I chatted with them and I said that you know I got this pushback thing. I could modernize it a little bit and and get it up to up to sort of modern looks, make it a little bit pretty, and we could you could you could ship it with the airplane and use that as pushback. You don't have to use the sort of manual pushback where you have to use the throttles to control the thing and everything. And they were like, "Sure, yeah, sure, sounds cool. Let's do it." Nice. Well, we're very excited about that plane. Um, me being a professed Cessna slash Boeing guy. Uh, if, if, you know, th those of you out here who watch my channel, if the, uh, the flight factor converts this Boeing Cessna guy, then we know it's legit, <laughs> but it sounds like it's a good oh. quality, uh, aircraft and, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Boeing guy as well. So if I like it, it's gotta be good. And, and you do, you can say I that you like it. like it, right? Is that? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it is. It is going to make a splash, I think. Uh, one that will last in X plane. Um, yeah, it's it's still not quite done yet. So, and uh, please, folks, don't ask me when it's coming out because, frankly, I can't tell you what I don't know. So, yeah. I don't know. Pretty much, it's when it's done. Yeah. And and I can tell you that the development team is in a mad dash to uh, get it up to at least beta release quality and finish up the last sort of remaining obvious bugs and things that need to be done before you guys can get your hands on it. So yeah, don't expect the beta to have everything, but it'll be, I think you'll be pleased. I think you'll be pleased, even even given the current state of, of Airbus uh, in X-Plane. Yeah, I, I, I love the, you know, there's some criticism uh, and, and some of it's constructive uh, that comes about in our little Twitch and YouTube communities. Um, and, and people are like, well, well, they shouldn't release it as a, as a beta. And I'm like, get it into as many hands as possible. People will pay the price. They'll pay the money. And uh, you have all this, well, probably 15% of the people that buy it are act maybe, maybe less are actually going to report stuff, but I'm all for getting it into more hands. I, I, I like paid betas there. I'm not a big fan of them. Some people are not, but I am. Well, I mean, we're not forcing you to buy anything, right? Exactly. I mean, it's a choice. You, and you, you can, if you don't like it, you, yeah. you don't have to spend the money. And the it's beauty, not mandatory. the beauty of Twitch and YouTube is you can get not only just the aesthetic look, you can actually watch a flight live before you decide to buy. And you can watch six or seven flights and you can get the opinions exactly. of all these other people out there that are showing it before you buy it. So you're not forced to buy it. So I'm of the opinion that, yes, we're ready for it. I hope it's this year, um, and uh, I'm excited. 
And I, I'm I, pretty confident that the beta at least will be out this year for that, sure. That that's well, there you go. There we go. Our guesses are this year, folks. <laughs> All right. Well, we're here at Baltimore uh, International. Thank you for giving us a little background on on you and 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 your project. And uh, yeah, I hope to have. Uh, in fact, we talked about doing another stream. Sure. And that was when it when the beta comes out. Um, when it when it's available. Yep. And uh, you being a Boeing guy, I think you're perfectly suited to uh, do a, a, a slow and methodical cold and dark startup with me in the in the Flight Factor A320. <laughs> well, I got to make sure I get, read up on the FCOM then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can get it in the air, right? <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, I can extinguish all the lights so that it, the plane thinks it's happy. So there you go. There you I, go. I'd consider that success. Yeah, there's there's a couple of people like uh, and see well, I'm curious as to whether or not someone who is proficient with a jar aircraft is doing the proper procedure that will apply to this one and, and I'm wondering I'm oh, thinking yeah, that, there's going to be some difference though. No, no, no. They they're, they're going to be right at home. Um really? in terms okay. of procedure, uh the problem with the jar as far as I understand it, I don't own it, so I can't tell you for sure, but what I've heard from other people, the problems with the jar have more to do with the fact that it uh, it has bugs and it has some weird, weird quirks, but from the sort of got from the functioning, the rough sort of outline Thanks, of the procedures, it's mostly all right. So, yeah, and and that that will work. Um, you sub, won't be able to mishandle the airplane subcribe. quite so much. We got to subscribe. Oh, hold on one second. We Saint got to subscribe. Appreciate it. You're you're giving some good content. I didn't want you to the alert to over talk there so uh, okay continue go ahead sorry about that no problem Thank you. I, I saw I, I saw your invisible sticks and i knew you to shut up <laughs> so yeah uh, so the jar say i'm sorry go ahead and continue where you left off sure no problem time. i mean i was pretty much done so yeah as far as i understand the jar is it's just the, the only problems with it really is that it's buggy and it has some weird behaviors so like the fly by wire doesn't really work all that well Okay. And and the sort of hand flying feeling is is strange, and so in terms of bugs, like it'll it'll make weird turns or something. But in terms of programming, the user interface should be pretty much the same. I mean, it's an Airbus. It, it's an A320, uh, unless Jar did completely strange things, which I don't think it did. Um, yeah, people should be right at home. Okay. And I can tell you that the hand flying characteristics of the flight factor are beautiful. Um, it's it's right up there with the IXEG probably or maybe even nicer uh, it's hard to tell for me but uh, I can tell you that it flies beautifully alright so that's that's not only a compliment to the upcoming product but it's also a compliment to the IXEG so that's but yeah a lot of oh, people yeah. look at that flight model and they say okay yeah that's that's the one of the benchmarks out there that are available so yeah yeah the IXEG is also very nice very nice yeah all right, let's uh, let's catch up with chat. Thank you for the uh, the volume uh, check there, Tony. I think I need to talk a little bit closer to the microphone. Uh, Saint Wolfric, no, you're free to subscribe anytime. No, no problem. Uh, the 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 red raider, the plugin at the top left that shows frame rate, um, that's in the sim. So if you go up here to settings and then you go to data output, I've got too many things on right now. So I've got uh, I show the uh, the the altimeter or Q and H setting in the sim. Not only what it is in the in the weather, uh, but what it, what's set in the plane. I can turn those off for right now. And then the frame rate is up here at the top, and you can tell it to show in cockpit. You can even do a network via UDP, and I think that's how that would be kind of nice to be able to show my frame rate on a different computer, because really I don't think you guys care to see my frame rate, but I'd like to see it on occasion to see if there's a stall or what have you. All right, we're here in the Caron the brand new Caronado uh, Cessna 208 Caravan. This is the X-Plane 11 version, um, and this uh, this engine right up here is called a PT6. So we're going to talk to uh, Sasho. Um, I'm, uh, Sasha or Sasho? What's the what would the um, locals say? The the former one probably. Sasho, okay. Yeah. So, so like okay. I gotta get that right. So we're gonna. So yeah, go ahead and um, I think you had maybe a picture for a little bit later or now, but uh, tell us a little oh, bit I, about the uh, uh, maybe the big picture of the of the PT six. Yeah, sure. Um, I sent you the picture over Discord, so you should be able to can find you, it there. Can you? 
I have Discord on the other streaming PC. Can you, by chance, post that in the in the live chat room? If you haven't. Uh, sure. Hang on. I, I thing is, I have the picture on a different machine, but oh, oh, I should okay. be able to. No, 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 no. Don't worry. I, I'll manage. I'll manage. Um, I am reasonably proficient in this, you know. Good morning, Gavin. Good morning, staff guy. You know you're tired when you spill your first cup. I of am coffee. reasonably uh, proficient. Yeah, so you know, my message is deleted, but I'll send it Good to morning. you as a whisper. How about that? That'll work. Oh, yeah. There you go. No worries. Sorry, uh, I got okay. night bot police going on here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I can understand that you don't want to have your chat turn into a swamp. It goes a little overboard at times, but. <laughs> sure. Um, in any case, so what's PT6? Um, so, uh, so from a rough overview, so the general name for it is that it's a reverse flow, reverse axial flow, free power turbine engine. Um, which is a whole mouthful, and it describes it relatively well, but it's uh, hard to f for people who are not really familiar with engine design. It's kind of a it's kind of a just jumbled mess. So, what's so first of all, what's a turbine engine? A turbine engine is a type of heat engine that exploits the combustion of gas in order to produce mechanical power. With that, that's an, that's an engine. Or any heat engine, and a turbine engine fundamentally means that it has it uses turbines to extract energy out of a stream of gas. So, one of the most um, one of the fastest ways to trigger an engineer and get them get them into a red hot rage is if you if you point at a jet engine and call it a turbine. Like, look, that that airplane there has two turbines. <laughs> and that, that'll just send them over the edge because it's not a turbine; it's a turbine engine. It's sort of like pointing at the hood of a car and saying that it's got a piston under there. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure, but it's got a piston engine. <laughs> so the turbine just refers to the mechanical device that extracts energy from a stream of gas. That's all it is. That's why they call them wind turbines because they're there to extract energy from a flowing gas mm. or fluid generally. Um, so what a turbine engine does is basically um, does all the four things that your regular sort of heat engine cycle does, which nominally those are called the suck, squeeze, bang, and blow cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, in a piston engine, you've got uh, all these four actions occurring in the same place at different times. So initially it'll, uh, it'll ingest gas, then it'll compress it, then it'll combust it, and finally it'll exhaust it. In a turbine engine, all these four actions take place at the same time, but in different places of the engine. So you've got an inlet, you got a compressor, you got a combustor, then you got an exhaust section or uh, a jet pipe, frequently referred mm. to as that. And so a PT6 is uh, it's somewhat. So if you look at the do at the picture here, the cutaway. It looks uh, somewhat convoluted and twisted around, but basically what it does, uh, the important thing is, for, first of all, to, so to get your bearings on the on roughly what the engine, how it's built, or what it's, where it's located, um, the thing on the left is actually the front of the engine. So the flange looking thing, that's the propeller attachment flange. That's where your propeller mounts. And funny enough, the intake is on the very right you'll see a little screen there that's sort of like like a ring around the engine. It's just to the left of, of the green, green part. Mm -hmm. And that's the inlet screen. So when I said that it's a reverse flow engine, that really means that the gas is flowing in the opposite direction than the engine is orientated. So it goes from back to front, which is kind of an unusual way to build okay, an engine. Wow, but, yeah. but there are good reasons for it. Um, so it takes in gas at the inlet screen. Does it roughly make sense for you where that is? Yeah. Yep. So it takes gas in. So it takes air in at the at the inlet screen, and they usually the duct to get uh, the intake uh, air into the engine goes either along the bottom or the side of the engine. So if you look on the caravan, you can see it's the opening on the right hand side of the engine. That's the inlet duct. And. Uh, Right over so, the larger, the larger one. Yeah. Okay. The bigger one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it takes in, it, it goes, 
Yeah, it takes in gas that flows sort of uh, along the engine, then goes in through the inlet screen, makes a 180 degree turn, then enters a multi-stage axial compressor. So those are the individual sort of uh, blade things. The, bl the so in goes, around the blue. Uh, you have to go to look at the very end of the engine. And uh, hang on, actually, actually, let me, you know, I'll, I'll find you a better picture with, with labels. Uh, I kind of like this colorful one. It's kind of nice. Hello to Dang Driver. Uh, we got uh, WTF1310. Hello. Uh, WTF1310. Uh, while uh, Sasha is looking for that uh, other PT6 picture, um, go ahead and post a link to, if you if you want to, to the video that you did for Premier One Driver. Uh, many of us are big fans of Premier One Driver or P1D. WTF1310 did a uh, compilation uh, video for him, and P1D published that yesterday on his channel. So if, if you want, if you could, if you want to post a link here so people can check that out, but of course, check it out after the stream. <laughs> or if you're not interested in PT six, go check it out and come back later for the startup part of it. Sure. Yeah. P one D is a cool guy. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool. Cool collaboration. So the John fly theme song is also brought to you by WTF 1310. We play that on the stream on occasion. All right. Okay. Uh, I sent you the picture, uh, the one that actually has labels on it that'll help it, probably I'm not getting identify. any whispers from you. Really? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you on Discord or Twitch, Whisper? I'm on Twitch. Yeah, I'm not. Let me see if I can send you one. There's hi. Test. Yeah, I got test. I didn't. Oh, there we go. I just got that one. That's weird. Okay, let me bring this one up. Again, for those of you uh, just joining, this is Toto Ritko, uh, otherwise known as uh, Sasho, and uh, he's the author of the Better Pushback uh, plugin that we talked about earlier on the stream, and he's also a real-world PPL, and uh, we're talking about the PT6 today, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, make this a little bit uh, larger than life. Let's see, let's bring it right. up. There we go. All right, so we got, I see that. We got the propeller shaft and then the reduction. Yeah. Exhaust. So the inlet screen is at the very end almost. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This looks a little so bit the, different than the other picture. Um, oh, yeah, it's the same thing. I can It's just you. the cutout. Just looks, a little, I guess, the colors and everything. Uh, Might be slightly differently colored, but overall, it's, it's roughly the same thing. Okay. If, so you, the, if you A, B between the th two things, you'll see that they're mostly the same thing. Okay, so the the inlet screen. Oh, we got a subscribe. Cool. Apache X2. We got a subscribe. Whoops, I did it again. Thank you for the subscribe. I was trying to lo uh, locate the inlet screen on the colored photo, but I can't really see we it. Got a, probably cause it's we got away. a subscribe. It's probably right here in the green, isn't it? Uh, no. It should be visible, but, but don't worry. Yeah, 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 it's slightly cut. It's a little bit sort of harder further out. It's it. yep. harder to see. Okay. All right, go ahead. So the inlet screen is where it's, it's sort of a fine mesh screen, really. It's just to prevent like big chunks falling into the engine, being sucked in like pieces of bird or stones or something. And uh, from there on out, it just travels through what's called the axial compressor. Um, the axial compressor contains blades that are rotating at a pretty high rate of speed. At full speed, at full tilt, the engine, uh, the that part of the engine rotates at about 38,000 RPM. And uh, so it goes at a feral whack. 38,000? Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, between 36 to 39,000, depending on the exact model. Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, the smaller the compressor, the faster you have to spin it to get actually any compression. So the, the compressor in your engine's turbocharger in a car is easily 120,000 RPM. But in any okay. case, uh, so this thing is doing it about doing it about 38 to 39,000 RPM, and then you get to what's called the centrifugal compressor, which just uh, do, does another stage of compression and pushes the air out to the outside of the engine. So this is all, by the way, the whole engine is built sort of like uh, it's it's 
uh, it's radially symmetrical, so it's a ring. Every time when, when you're looking at this, you have to realize it's basically the cut is a cutaway. So the the feature that you're looking at goes all the way around the engine. Mm. And so from the compressor, it then goes through it's called what's called a diffuser and enters a combustion chamber. Now, in the combustion chamber, funny enough, the air does another 180 degree turn and it starts going back forward again. I'm sorry, ba backward from the point of view of the flight direction. So mm -hmm. it starts going a little bit back. In the combustion chamber, it's a little bit hard to see on the sort of labeled cutaway, but in the in the other cutaway, you'll see that at the forward end of the combustion chamber, there's a bunch of nozzles. Okay. This is what's called an annular combustion chamber. Annual basically means donut. Um, or ring hole, a ring shaped hole. And uh, there's, I don't know it's a, if it's about 30 or so little, yeah, they're, they're at the at the sort of side of it that you can see. Mm. There, there are 30, approximately 30 fuel injectors. They are spraying fuel into the combustion chamber that is mixed with the air and then creates, it's burned. Uh, the, the whole engine is, every turbine engine pretty much is self-sustaining in combustion. So once it's lit, it's lit, it, it'll, it'll stay lit. And the combustion chamber is designed in such a way that it's basically a continuous ring of fire being suspended in there and not touching the sides of the sides of the combustion chamber. Cause it, it's too, the fire is about 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it would basically melt any metal that it comes into contact with. Wow. So it is suspended in there with a whole bunch of other air that's coming from the compressor. It's called cooling air. And the that air is the only thing separating that yeah. from, from the, the surfaces. Wow. Yes. Okay. Wow. Um, and so the, uh, the, as the flame sort of travels down the combustion chamber, uh, it, it gets sort of diluted down. It, it gets cooled off by the extra, extra air. And at the same time, the volume of the of the gas increases, obviously, because you get more gas you, that you're putting in there. On most turbine engines, the rough ratio of the amount of air used for combustion versus the amount of air used for cooling is about um, 85 to 90 percent to or nine to one, roughly the ratio. So nine parts of the air are used for cooling, and only approximately one out of ten parts is used for combustion. Okay. So the vast majority of the air is just there to keep the engine from from melting. Melting, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, and so the air sort of then makes another turn and starts flowing forward again from the flight direction, and it enters the turbine sections. So here's the part where it's where it's why it's called the a free power turbine engine is. You can see on this here picture, you can see three turbines in sequence. So you'll see basically three sort of disks in that red section. Mm -hmm. So the first disk is what's called the compressor turbine. And its function is simply to drive the compressor. It's on a single shaft with the compressor. And it takes the hottest and most high energy portion of the gas and works in, exact, in basically the reverse of how a compressor works. A compressor takes mechanical energy and puts it into a gas, a turbine extracts energy out of a gas and makes it into mechanicals or spinning energy. Mm -hmm. And so the about two thirds of the energy of that gas is consumed by the compressor turbine. And all, uh, you've got to expend all that energy to get the air to compress. Uh, it, compressing air, especially at the volumes and compression le levels that are required to make a turbine engine work efficiently, it takes a whole lot of energy. Mm -hmm. So if you've got so if you've got an engine that produces a thousand horsepower net output, it takes about another two thousand horsepower to just drive the compressor internally. Oh wow! Yes, Nicholas uh, VDS. Yep, we're learning about the PT6 today. Yep, Gaming Reborn. Yeah, this is we're gonna we're talking about the PT6 engine uh, with Total Ritko, and we're going to uh, we're gonna go through a startup procedure here in a bit. And basically what I'm talking about right now applies to pretty much every turbine engine out there or most of them anyway. So it doesn't really matter if it's a turboprop, a turbojet, turbofan. Uh, the core of the engines is pretty much the same in all of them or very, very similar. The principles are, similar, but are, are almost the same. 
and so once the once the gas has passed the compressor turbine, it still has a fair amount. It's about a, another third of the energy is left over in it, and you can extract that. So then what you do with it is up to you, really. Um, you'll see, if you, if you zoom in on a picture, if you use the other picture, you'll notice that there's actually a gap between the first and the second turbines. They're, they're not on the same shaft even. So the re that's the reason why it's called a free power turbine engine is because the compressor is completely separate from the, from the other turbines. The compressor is only driven by the compressor turbine. Then there's a gap. And then there's what's called the power turbine. That's where you actually tap off your useful energy out of the engine. So you can have one sit, sit, one uh, power turbine. You can have multiple of them. Really up to you. Or really up to the exact fine details of the design of the engine. Obviously, the more power turbines you put in there, the more energy you extract out of the gas. But at the same time, um, the power turbines are hugely expensive. Uh, a, a power turbine, uh, let's say, a blade on one of those costs around a thousand dollars. So one of one of those power turbines can easily run you. Fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> they are they are extremely expensive. So it's a trade off. It's between it's, it's it's a trade off of how much efficiency do you want out of the engine versus the amount of capital cost you've got in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like oh, yeah. yeah. That's true to life in a lot of areas. <laughs> Should I buy and, the inexpensive uh, car? and uh, have issues along, you know, in the long run, or should I buy the nice car yeah. that's going to run longer? <laughs> well, you're going to spend yeah. more money up front. And even worse, it's the, the, uh, the, the payback you get out of the efficiency of the engine is actually exponentially diminishing. So the more power turbines you put in there, the less actual usefulness you get out of the ones that are further downstream. Yeah. And at some point, the gas has just so little energy left that you cannot even use it to drive a turbine anymore. So yeah. at that point, you pretty much just have to exhaust it because it's just waste. Um, so once you get the power out of the engine and those uh, power turbines, so the picture that you're looking at, the one with the labels, uh, is actually a slightly different variant of the PT6. Uh, they differ by the number of power turbines and the number of compressor stages. Uh, Pratt and Whitney Canada makes these things in like a, about 40 or 50 variants, depending on the exact application. So they'll vary the number of power turbines, the number of compressor stages, just slightly the dimension of the engine, and that'll change the performance of the engine. And of course, of course, also the cost. Yeah. So once you get it out of the, so the power turbine, by the way, it spins at max maximum whack. It spins at about 33,000, 32,000 RPM. And that you cannot really use to drive a propeller. That is a little bit of a problem. Mm. So the next thing after that, if you look uh, to the left of the power turbine, there's a shaft running into what's called the radial reduction, um, the axial reduction gearbox. So it's a set of reduction gearings that are designed to take the 33,000 RPM out of the turbines and the, the power turbine and get it down to your propeller RPM. So your maybe 2000 rpm on the propeller or something um the 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 cessna 2a the caravan uses a 2000 rpm propeller uh the beach 1900 uses a 1700 rpm propeller so you'd have wait there's even, a, there's more rpm on the caravan huh yes, oh i a, guess with the, a smaller with the 1900 you got two of them 217s okay yeah uh no rpm is actually not necessarily good um for a propeller, a propeller actually wants to spin at a certain speed that is dependent on the on the diameter of the propeller. Okay. Because you cannot, you, you can't. Basically, the bigger the propeller, the slower you have to spin it. Because uh, if you spin it very very fast, your tips are going to be approaching uh, Mach one locally, the speed of sound, and you get um, blade tip vortices forming and supersonic shock waves, <laughs> which basically massively reduce the efficiency of the propeller and wow. you will you'll just be it'll be one it'll be un, unbearably loud because yeah. you'll basically be throwing off supersonic shock waves in every direction all wow. the time it'll be like a bunch of little concords flying around your wings <laughs> so okay and, so the reduction gearbox takes that that high amount of energy and brackets it down to the rpm that's relative to the size of the prop yeah. okay yes and that is all designed for the specific aircraft type that you are using. So you don't have to, the gearbox is basically fixed. 
it's it's really just a step down gearing. What is the oh, XF eighty four H? Oh yeah, the impossibly uh, the impossibly loud thing. The XF eighty four H is was an experimental oh, aircraft yeah, yeah. in the forties and fifties that the U.S. military was experimenting with designing an airplane that could go close to the speed of sound with a propeller, and it used what's called a supersonic propeller design. <laughs> Extremely wide blades that are there. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, uh, the, each blade is like a foot, uh, a foot in, in sort of length. I'm sorry, not, not length, but the diameter, the, the, the sort of thickness of the blade is about a foot. And... It is a very, very large propeller, and it was designed to fly with the blade blade tips at supersonic velocity, Jeez. which uh, made it unbearably loud. I mean, it worked, but my God. Yeah, there was a reason why they called it a thunder screech. You know, uh, thunder screech is... I might use that word for my one-year-old at times. Um, so, the... Uh, <clears throat> I imagine the pilots there suffered some 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 ear loss because some hearing loss because even um, I was I was watching a, a I don't know if you've uh, caught one of uh, Black Box Seven Eleven's streams but yep. he, he's a, a real world pilot as well and he 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 was saying that he has hearing loss because they didn't have a lot of good uh, noise canceling headsets I can only imagine what the thunder screecher did to the pilots hearing they oh, must have really holy shit. Uh, um. <laughs> Well, if you Good. consider how much consideration sometimes the military has for the personnel. <laughs> wow. You know, primary mission is to actually go fast afterwards. It's The secondary consideration is whether the pilot can actually survive it. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, well, we got... Okay, now we're up to the shaft, so um, anything so more yeah, about the it, propeller shaft? That's pretty much it. I mean, at that point, the the very end of it is where you what's called the prop flange. Is that's where you attach the propeller, uh, constant speed unit, and drive mechanism. Okay. That's pretty much where the propeller goes. And so you have to understand that you're looking at the engine when, uh, when the when you're looking at the how the air flows into the engine, it's actually back to front. Mm. So that's why, uh, on the on a caravan, if you look at it, you'll see that the exhaust is actually coming all the way from just behind the propeller, which normally people would be kind of surprised. They think it'd be back, yeah, further, yeah. Yeah, you'd be looking at it like it's somewhere around the tail, right? Yeah. No, it's actually right up there at the front. Um, Okay, now I understand that. And on a King Air, it's even more pronounced because the King Airs have like these very large sort of uh, 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 like like bell-shaped exhausts Mm. that are coming right from behind the propeller attachment point for the propeller fairing so yeah so that's that's sort of a dead giveaway when you see when you see an engine that has an exhaust that is right behind the propeller and then you see a large sort of section of cowling where you would expect the engine to be that's sort of a dead giveaway of a pt6 Mm. now there are other reverse flow engines but the pt6 is one of the most numerous ones out there Uh, the way that the reason why they designed it like this is because it keeps it makes the design reasonably simple Mm-hmm. Um, because you can, uh, you can see that the compressor shaft and the power shaft do not pass through each other because the propeller, sort of the power turbine, has to be downstream from the compressor turbine. The, the the power turbine has to be downstream from the compressor turbine. If you wanted to design a uh, free power turbine engine with a with a regular flow, so just a str- from f- uh, fr- uh, front to back. Mm-hmm. Then you would have to have one shaft passing through the other, which is not impossible to do, but it's a little bit more expensive. Yeah. So that way you can you can sort of keep the power turbine shaft fairly short, and you can keep them from passing through each other. It also makes maintenance really really simple because you can unbolt the whole power turbine section with the propeller and just pull it away from the engine, and you don't have to take the engine apart completely. Mm. which on a turbine engine is pretty expensive. Yeah, I can imagine. All right, I have, a, I have a few questions. Um, so does this run on Jet A then? Yes, all pretty much all turbine engines run on turbine fuel of some sort. Okay. Which um, if you think of, uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's Jet A, Jet A1, Jet B, uh, or um, the, the after or whatever, 
whatever it's using in the world, uh, turbine engines are designed to run on something about the consistency of diesel. In fact, you could run an engine on, you could run a diesel truck on Jet A if you wanted to. Mm. Okay. It's basically the diesel refined to be to have a lower water content, but it's basically diesel. And there, there was some talk about how you, the Bell, what is the the Bell four twelve or something uses to mm -hmm. a PT six. Yeah, it uses it uses a a PT six T variant. Oh, let me get you a picture of that. A PT six T is uh, pretty much two PT sixes stuck together. Um, let me actually send it to you over Twitch. I see the PT6-9. I can bring up just the Google images here. I think I got one um, here. I sent, you, I sent you the picture. PT6-T is what's called the turbo shaft variant of the PT6. Um, yep, that's pretty close. Yeah, yeah that's pretty much it. Um, it's basically two PT6s. And if you look at the front of the, uh, uh, where you would expect the propeller to mount, there's actually a, a unification gearbox there, which takes both of the outputs of the two parts and puts them onto a single shaft. And that is then routed onto a helicopter rotor. Okay. Now, the nice thing about that kind of an arrangement is that it allows you to run the output with one engine shut down. So it's pretty much one. It's pretty much one of the most obvious ways to get a twin-engine helicopter that has the capability of having one engine fail and still be able to run. Oh, wow! Okay, that that's peace of mind for some people, for sure. Oh yeah, um, many helicopters are designed with two engines exactly for that one express purpose. It's in case you have an engine failure, the helicopter will still run. It'll still fly just fine. Mm. Uh, many of them might not be able to climb much anymore, but they will be able to, they'll be able to operate or at least get a very sort of smooth drift down. Mm. Hello, Jan Gray, twenty-three. Good, good morning, good afternoon. Skip Jack ninety-five says similar to the double Mamba engine on the Gannet. I'll, yeah, possible. Yeah, there there are many helicopters that have more than one engine. Uh, the Navy Super Stallion. Uh, the largest uh, helicopter in use by the U.S. military actually has three engines. Okay. All right, a couple more questions. Um, so you, you mentioned that Pratt & Whitney makes the PT-6 and all of its variations. Um, yeah, Pratt & Whitney Canada, not Pratt & Whitney. So Pratt & Whitney Canada. Is there a Pratt & Whitney U.S. then? So you? there's a Pratt & Whitney and there's Pratt & Whitney Canada. Oh, okay. Pratt & Whitney Canada is a separate subsidiary that does the PT-6. Okay. We know and about... Pratt & Whitney proper does the jet engines. And where are they based? Uh, they're based in the U.S. I keep forgetting what the exact base for Pratt & Whitney okay. is. Okay. I was curious about that because I was like, okay, I didn't realize Pratt & Whitney was a Can Canadian company, but it sounds like they're a global company and they've got operations in yeah, different yeah. different areas there. Uh, I keep forgetting if, if Pratt & Whitney Canada was actually formerly a completely separate company and that they just got... Uh, incorporated in Pratt & Whitney. I'm not sure, but I know that they're made by Pratt & Whitney Canada, which is a separate subsidiary with a lot of their own operation going on. It sounds like they pretty much own the market with regard to the, the turbine. In yeah. In, in terms of small turboprop engine, PT6s are the most common ones. In fact, they're one of the most common turboprop engines ever made. Yeah. They got, they made 47,000 sort of damn things. So. Wow. Okay, cool. 47,000 engines is, and they are fundamentally unchanged from the 60s. All right, so I got two more questions for you before we get into the startup routine. Um, sure. Where, where did you learn about the PT6? Was it self study or was there, did you, how? It's pretty much self, self study, okay. most of it anyway. Wow, that's pretty impressive. That's okay, that, wow. All right, and then my last question before we move on. Where did you learn your English? I don't know. I kind of just pick it up. Because you have, um, like, do you watch a lot of TV or movies in, in English? In American English? Because, well, mm. either UK, British, whatever, South African, whatever, you have, you've got good English. 
<laughs> so is that self-study as well, or have you lived abroad, or? Um, uh, my level of English actually I've acquired before ever have uh, ever ever been in America. So it's pretty much I guess from TV and and computers. Um, okay. I'm a bit of a I, I, I'm I pick up languages pretty easily. Okay. I don't know why it's kind of just something I have. What what else do you speak? But so you. I'm also, I'm also fluent in German. German, okay. Ein Bier bitte. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah, I lived in Germany for a couple of years uh, working. Uh, I, I lived in Germany, but I worked all over the continent uh, for an internet company. Um, really love, I really love Bavaria. Uh, I have been uh, to Prague. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, and I, I was also, you know, I'm old enough to, to, to go back to when it was uh, Czechoslovakia. And I remember mm-hmm. as a teenager um, getting on my ham radio and talking to people in, in Czechoslovakia. And I remember yep. exchanging these uh, confirmation cards of our contacts, whether it be on Morse code or voice or whatever. Yeah. And then I remember, uh, you know, obviously we had the, the split. What was the split in like 91? <laughs> It was eighty nine. Nah, split was ninety three. Ninety three. Okay, so it became the two the two countries, and I remember yeah. uh, them removing the ability on our award on our award uh, sheet. Okay, we'll count Czechoslovakia as a country still, but now you have these two countries that you can get separately. And I was like, yes, I got it before <laughs> it was was separated. But uh, yeah, before it was fun. cool. Yeah. So I've been to. Uh, so I've been to Prague. I, I I spent a lot of time there, I, but I have not been to the Slovakia side of things. So, sure. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing, it's just smaller. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. The beers, the beers, good. The pizza's good. It's just a little bit smaller. <laughs> Let's see here. All right, that's cool. German, and then you have your local language, which is yep. I guess Slovak. Slovak. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. My daughter speaks uh, fluent German because we lived there when she was uh, cool. ten and eleven years old. So awesome! Yeah, QSL cards. That's right, Lars Rass. Yeah, I'm a nerd. It's confirmed. I enjoy the ham radio hobby. It's taught me geography, if nothing else. All right, so let's go through the startup of the caravan. Sure. So it's really kind of simple. Um, for most PT sixes or pretty much any PT6 uh, does not use a full electronic engine control. Rather, the engine is controlled pretty much mechanically. So you have essentially full control of the engine uh, with your three levers. And the three levers are, uh, they're called power, condition, and prop. And rather, from the left to right, usually that's how they're arranged, is uh, power, prop, condition. Now, uh, the caravan has one extra lever there on the left, which is called an emergency power lever. And it pretty much is there just to enable your, you the ability to get some extra power out of the engine, uh, taking into account that you might actually damage it. But really, it really is there just for emergency. So you can basically ignore that one. The big black one is the power. Then you got the blue to the right of it, which is prop. Yeah, the emergency power you just leap down. Um, the black one is the power lever. That is there to set your. Oh, thing is, all these all these uh, levers work depending on some of the positions of the other levers here. So, uh, the primary function of the power lever is to set your what's called the gas generator RPM. That's the basically the compressor turbine slash compressor rotor RPM that controls essentially how much power the engine produces or how much gas is supplied downstream mm. and okay. picked up by your by your uh, compressor turbine i'm sorry the power turbine okay uh the propeller lever let is me take a guess obvious. that's talking to the reduction section no actually the, the reduction gearing is fixed uh, that one doesn't do anything. The, the, the reduction gearing is fixed and fixed? it doesn't change. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, for complicated reasons, it's really not easy to change gears <laughs> in flight. Mm. Um, now, the, pro- pro- the propeller lever is talking to what's called your uh, constant speed unit or the uh, propeller con- speed control, 
which actually sits forward of the uh, prop flange on the on the engine. So if you rem the the propeller speed control is not actually part of the engine proper itself. Mm. It's part of the propeller itself. Okay. So the the engine ends at the flange, and whatever you bolt on there is whatever you're gonna you know use the engine for. Okay. Um, important thing for a turbine engine is actually to have the uh, power turbine loaded with some load, something that slows it down. Because otherwise, even at idle, if you if the power turbine were allowed to spin on its own, it would spin up so fast that it would just disintegrate almost immediately. So you got to have a propeller on there or some sort of a braking load, so th something that will slow it down. Okay. Because otherwise you'd overspeed it. Even at idle, even at idle, these engines, say you've got the Caravan, I think is about an 800 shaft horsepower engine. Even at idle, these engines are producing on the order of 100 horsepower. Wow. Okay. Um, so you got to really load down the engine with something to do <laughs> once it's running. Mm. Uh, so the propeller lever, uh, what it does is controls a bunch of valves in the constant speed unit. And those then uh, automatically either, uh, either let out or put in more oil into a bunch of control pistons that control the blade angle of the propeller. And it's sort of based around some centrifugal forces and everything. But the it point uses basically is oil. Yeah. To make the it change. Oil. Wow. Yes. There's a so it's basically imagine it's sort of like two pistons on a in, in a common cavity and they are each working against each other. And one is sort of pushed by the centrifugal force of the propeller spinning, and the other is sort of pushed by by some uh, by some valve which you set by, with the propeller lever. So point is, as, as the if the propeller speeds up for whatever reason, then that will basically make reduce for for instance reduce the force on one piston, and it'll make the other piston go in, which will reduce blade angle or increase blade angle and whatever. It basically means it's a feedback mechanism. It's a mecha hydromechanical feedback mechanism that functions completely aut autonomously to control the speed of the propeller so that it never really changes. Okay. Never mi no matter the load on the propeller or uh, torque or whatever. Wow. So the lever, the, the position that you have it in right now is called the feather position. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a kind of a special position that is meant to turn the blades. That completely disengages the control, uh, the, the propeller speed control unit, and it just turns the blades so that they are as much in line with the flight path as possible. Um, when on the ground, if you have the engines in feather, they will produce almost no thrust. Basically, the, the it's called the flat angle pitch, where the blades are completely flat up against the air, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just literally it's just pushing anything. air off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not biting, it's just pushing off air to the side. It means that if there's anybody in front or behind the airplane, that gives them the basically the most safe position mm, okay. uh, so it doesn't blow on it doesn't sort of try to knock things over and it gives you a very slow speed of the propeller usually around maybe two three hundred rpm my max okay and uh, once you move it out of the position and past the sort of detent that you see there on the uh, on the model you'll get into the minimum rpm region so from there from this position up to the max you are controlling the governed speed of the engine. So from minimum RPM up to maximum RPM. And uh, I keep forgetting, I think the main minimum RPM, if you look on the if you look on the gauges there, it'll show, I think it's around it's around sixteen hundred RPM. Max RPM is two thousand. And so um, in that range, if the if the engine is producing enough power sixteen to then, nineteen, yeah. Yeah, if, if the engine is producing enough power, then the propeller control unit will keep the speed of the propeller at the value that you have it set, regardless of the power output of the engine or the flight speed of the aircraft or sort of any variable. Uh, obviously, if the engine is pr not producing enough power, then the speed will decay uh, up to some minimum value. doesn't really matter what it is. Skipjack uh, is asking if there's a beta. It looks like there is a beta. Uh, yeah, so beta range is something that is normally controlled by the uh, by the propeller lever. Yeah, uh, so the normal forward uh, on many engines, including the PT6 engines, typically in use, uh, the propeller has 
essentially three positions in which it will in which it will function. I'm sorry, the, the blades have three positions. So if you've got sort of maximum blade angle at the front, then it'll reduce up to flat pitch, where essentially what's called the blade angle is zero degrees relative to the incoming air. And then you have negative blade angle, where the propeller is actually not pushing air backwards, but forwards. It's just sort of pushing away from the air. Um, most engines have what's called an alpha, beta, and reverse range. The, the alpha range is sort of the normal flight range that you use for regular flight. So it'll go from uh, sort of uh, maximum pitch to up to minimum pit, minimum flight pitch, which is usually some value around say 10 degrees. Below that, uh, below that, if you go into what's called the beta range, that is usually only used for tax, taxiing because the engine is so slow to respond at very low power settings. If you, for example, if you're near, uh, near idle, if you advance the power, it'll take the engine a good five to 10 seconds to actually give you anything. It takes a whole lot of time to spin it up. He's saying it's odd minimum. to have it on the power lever. Uh, not necessarily, no. Actually, pre t sexes always do that. Same thing for Beechcraft, same, same thing for, for many pt sex applications. Um, having it elsewhere is actually uh, a more sophisticated method of control. Um, I think he's talking about things like Dash 8 or something like that, which have it, or on the Saab, which have it, what's called a combined propeller condition lever. Uh, mm. Those things are much smarter than than the regular old PT6. PT6 is a pretty dumb little engine, which is great because you can learn a lot about how to th how the thing actually works. Um, so, so when once in the beta range, um, the engine is pretty much at idle RPM, and to get it up from idle RPM takes, as I said, about five to ten seconds, which makes it pretty hard to taxi with it. So many many aircraft. I don't know if this Carinado 206 does it. Um, I remember I had to patch my 1900 in X plane 10 to get it to actually work right. Mm. Um, but the beta range is keeping the engine pretty much at idle RPM and instead using propeller blade angle. So as I said, normal flight range is down to 10 degrees. Beta range might be something from 2 to 10 degrees. And instead of the uh, power lever in the beta range controlling engine RPM, it instead controls com propeller blade angle. So the propeller is much faster to respond than the engine. So you could just shove the propeller lever a little bit forward and the engine will all of a sudden give you a little bit of thrust, just enough for taxiing, basically. Skipjack has a, another question there. Sure. Mm. So since there's, since there's no, no computer com to manage it, how does the power lever affect the prop to make it go into beta? Uh, the power lever controls, uh, there's a bunch of feedback cables that go back to the propeller control unit. And uh, I don't I can't tell you the exact mechanical arrangement because it really varies. But uh, the power lever is actually linked to both the fuel control unit and the con constant speed unit. And once it's in beta range, the constant, the propeller lever takes over from the prop lever and instead controls the constant speed unit below the normal alpha, the flight range of pitch. So instead of controlling the fuel control at that point, the power lever starts controlling the constant speed unit. Okay. And below the beta range is uh, basically the reverse range, which is, which the, the, prop lever does an even funnier this uh, sorry the power lever does an even funnier thing is that at that point it controls both power and pitch and it keeps on decreasing pitch all the way down to negative values so let's say minus five degrees and it also increases engine rpm so since the engine is all of a sudden speeding up and it has negative blade angle instead of biting into the air and shoving it backward it starts biting into the air and shoving it forward so you get reverse thrust, mm. even though the engine is still spinning in the same direction. What has changed is the blade angle relative to your direction of flight. Uh, Aerosim so, Gaming says there are a bunch of cams that deal with the throttle position. Once the power level lever lever moves out of the cammed position, the prop is no longer controlled by the power lever. Yep. 
Okay. Uh, I've, I've never seen it actually taken apart, so it's possible there. I can imagine that there's a fairly complex mechanical arrangement in the uh, either down in the engine or up here at the lever position. Good morning, Rush. All right. Fun, fun facts and, here. And so the final lever that I'm going to talk about is the condition, which is all the way up on the right. It's usually red or... or it's yeah. sort of a spi spiky handle, so the way that that's yeah. how you know it. Cut off low and high. And and it only, yeah, it basically has only three positions on the PT-6. It has fuel off, low idle position, and high idle position. And the, uh, yeah, on the, on the, in the, in the idle position, it really, what it just does is it shuts off uh, the, uh, high pressure fuel valves and it starves the engine of fuel the engine shuts down you're done mm. uh, when starting up from the low idle position once the engine has reached sufficient rpm and i'm going to be talking about that a little bit more in the startup procedure once the engine has sufficient rpm then you put it into a low idle position that starts a sort of introductory minimum fuel flow to get the engine up and running now since i said the engine is uh and since I said the engine is rather mechanical, there's no computers or electronics or anything, um, the fuel pump is also mechanical. So as soon as the engine is spinning, the fuel pump is spinning, and the fuel pump is trying to pump fuel into the engine. So you got to prevent it from starting to put fuel into the engine too soon. So that's why you have the condition in the cutoff position mm. when the engine is sort of just about starting up. Then once you reach sufficient start RPM, and for most turbine engines, it's between, it's between 12 and 25% of rated RPM. Uh, in the PT-6, it's usually about 12%. Okay. That's when you can sort of put the condition up into the low idle position. That opens the high pressure fuel valves. Fuel starts flowing to the fuel injectors, and that starts the sort of starting spray of the fu of fuel into the engine. And, and it lights, catches, and it starts accelerating. Okay. Uh, w once the engine is started up and sort of stabilized, um, you take it. You can take it from the low idle position. The reason for there being a low idle and a high idle is that when you're sitting on the ground, there's not really much load on the engine, and you don't you, you don't usually need to run it at a very high RPM to sort of do things like run the air conditioner or run some very high loads. Um, so at that point, you can just keep a low idle and keep your fuel burn low, keep the engine more economical when you're sitting on the ground. Mm. Once once you are sort of putting more load on the engine or getting ready to take off, then you would move it, or, or even when you just want to start taxiing, you move it up into the high idle position. The engine boosts a little bit higher in RPM, so it goes from like, I don't know, low idle might be something like 55 60%, and high idle might be something closer to 65 to 70% the engine sort of rounds up a little bit higher. You can put more loads on it. You can start extending flaps, activating high load avionics and stuff like that. A turn on the air conditioning and the engine will uh, sort of be able to keep with that because that's a mechanical load on the shaft there on the, on the compressor shaft. Mm. Uh, what I didn't explain to you in the, in the cutaways is that most of these sort of mechanical loads on the engine, the accessories, just so things like an air compressor, a an engine, an electric generator, stuff like that, is directly connected to the compressor shaft via another, what's called an accessory gearbox. So if you load that down, you're actually slowing down the engine. So that's why the high idle position is there. It basically gives the engine permission to burn a little bit extra fuel on the ground, and uh, it gives you a higher RPM so that you are able to drive more loads and have still have the engine idling at oh, a reasonable okay. RPM. Uh, Aerosim Gaming had a few more comments there, I, I think backing up yep. just a little bit, if you could read those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the power lever going into the prop. Um, it's all down on the engine. That so it it's, breaks. it's all down on... Yeah, it breaks off the fuel, it breaks off at the fuel control unit. Yeah, yeah, I guess, uh, it, yeah. yeah, I can imagine. It's probably, there's a there's one cable. He was just yeah, talking yeah. about the beta control. Yeah. yeah, I understand. I understand. The beta control, uh, yeah, it probably is just based around a cable going from this lever here, and then there might be a set of cams closer by the fuel control unit. I didn't really want to go into to the nitty-gritty of where the fuel control unit is located and what a fuel metering unit is and what a low and high pressure fuel uh, pump is and stuff like that. But you like have that. to understand really... that turns rush on. So you, you sometimes you have to go into those details. 
Uh, it, it turns. <laughs> it, turns <laughs> it, it turns five percent of people on, and the other ninety-five percent are put off. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, it reminds me of a. It reminds me of a comment which a which an author of a mathematics book said. Uh, his publisher always tends to say that every equation that you put in the book basically halves your readership. <laughs> so be, use them sparingly. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. Okay. And cool. So to so to start the engine now, the important thing for an en a turbine engine is fundamentally limited by one thing and one thing only. It's the turbine inlet temperature. It's how much heat the turbine, the, the compressor turbine, can sustain without melting. And that really is the fundamental limitation of how much fuel you can put into the engine. Okay. And since, as I explained, the engine really, really relies on lots of cooling air to, get the, to keep the engine from burning itself apart, in order to get the engine started, you first have to spin it up to a minimum RPM where there's just enough air going through the engine such that when you start actually burning stuff in it, mm -hmm. it won't just blow up. Or, or it won't just catch fire. Mm -hmm. um, so on a PT6, the way you do it, uh, and on most engines, the way you do it, sometimes you have an automatic controller for that, but basically the way you do it is you keep uh, the propel the power lever is at full idle, so maximum idle. You can keep it at beta range. You can keep it at, uh, at the uh, flight idle, the alpha range. doesn't really matter what it is. It has to be at the idle position. About, uh, well, prop lever. It's interesting how in the Carinado model here, I can't move the the power lever at all until we start. Kind really? Of, yeah. That's kind of a broken behavior. You can move the propeller and you can mo move the condition lever, but you can't move the prop. Maybe it's related to the brake being on or something. I don't know. It has to be some plug-in thing because normally in the aircraft you can just grab that lever and move it around as much as you want. But in this case, we are in the uh, hey, idle. Skip Jack's already getting out the lotion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to put the mature flag on if we go too far with these. <laughs> uh, but it's in, it's in the idle position, so we can continue yeah, yeah. from there. Yeah. That's awesome. So the propeller lever really doesn't matter where you keep it. Normally, the, the uh, checklists say to keep it on max RPM. But if you have people standing around the airplane or you expect to be, do things like unchalk the airplane after startup, you can just keep it in the feather position. That's fine. Because the engine is a free power turbine engine, the power turbine doesn't really matter even if it's, it's completely stays stopped at startup. That's all right. Because the thing that we're caring about is the compressor shaft, not the power shaft. Okay. So you can keep the propeller at feather or at max RPM, doesn't matter. The conditions always, always, always at cutoff during start. Uh, All right, if you important kept note right there, everyone. Condition lever at cutoff during start. A lot of people don't do that when I watch yeah. them, including myself and, in the past. Yeah, and I can tell you what would happen in reality. Since the fuel pump is mechanical and it starts pumping as soon as the engine is uh, is spinning up. That means that you you'll get fuel flow at very low engine RPMs. So you'll pe pretty much get a trickle of fuel going into the engine during the initial sort of spin up spool up to the ma minimum like 10%. But since the engine igniters are going automatically at the same time, there's no hydrolock. Don't worry, <laughs> Eddie. Attacks 99. Uh, you're not going to get hydrolock because it's a turbine engine. It's not a piston engine. Uh, a turbine. So what you would get is basically a pool of fuel collecting in the combustor, and then it'll get ignited when there's pretty much almost no uh, fuel flow going through the engine. So what you would get is essentially a all of a sudden the combustion chamber would be in flames with almost no air to keep it cool, mm. um, and you would get a tailpipe fire <laughs> essentially almost immediately. You would see your your uh, engine temperature shoot up like crazy going way past the red mark and you would see lots of flame coming out the exhaust could be fun and it could be uh and like especially at oh, night it, it'll be it, it'll look awesome <laughs> right up until you realize that at that point you need to shut down the engine disassemble it and you're looking pro probably at easily <laughs> Yeah, you, I mean, you, even just a hot hot section inspection is easily will run, <laughs> easily will run you five to ten grand. So, mm. uh, hot section inspection means that they'll take apart the hot section of the engine and inspect all the turbine blades mm. to see if there's any cracking or 
uh, cracking or melting or anything. Mm. And, and I and I can actually show you what a hot hot start uh, what a hot start looks like. Hey Stuck, good morning. Uh, and let's see. Uh, if you have a tailpipe fire. Uh, Cessna Rocks, see. good morning. I saw you in there earlier. Agent Jay Z inspected a melted AI twenty five. It's not pretty. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That, those things are, uh, and exactly that's that's the one actually I'm looking for right now. Um, let's see. Uh, Agent Jay Z, and it was actually a T fifty six, I think, or T fifty eight. Um, where he took apart an engine that had a tail fire, tailpipe fire. Um, let's see. Give me just a second. I'll find the right right video. You feel free to chat with the folks here. This is this is good stuff. This is quality. I'm just gonna give everyone everyone. Uh, we'll give everyone 750 John Fly miles just for being here. But I gotta make sure it's at all. We're gonna give away a, a PT6 on the stream today. <laughs> no. Okay, so you have to here's pay for about the shipping, a though. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I I pay gladly if you give me a PT6, a real one. Mm. Okay, so let me send you. This is a video here. Uh, I sent it to you over Twitch, uh, Whisper. And it comes up to a section where the guy, where Agent Jay Z is disassembling an engine that has had a tailpipe fire. Oh yeah. Um, I can, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So it, it's it's a very sad story. You can see that. Yeah, those blades were supposed to go all the way out to the edge. So. So he's talking about what, a John Fly start back in the day. Yep, that's what he's talking about right now. So what you're looking at there is a T-58, it's a helicopter engine, about 1,200 horsepower rating. And oh, the silvery parts are actually melted blades. Uh, from This is the, the power turbine section. The compressor turbine is even further down there, and it's even worse. And the, the silvery parts that you're looking at there are deposited remains of the, of the compressor turbine. So rookie so, pilot, essentially. Oh, uh, yeah. The, it, this engine actually, as I think, was from an old helicopter and was used for jet boats. Um, but yeah, they've done an incorrect start or something went wrong with the fuel control. Way too much fuel, way too little air. And uh, uh, yeah. It, so it, what's it ended Agent Jay-Z all about? Is he just... He's a, he's a Canadian a turb engine, turbine engine overall technician. Okay. So he actually does work in this. And to a uh, question from Chuckle Hut Cynic. Um, uh, no, the turbine blades are not made out of titanium. They're made out, out of high nickel steel. Uh, you cannot make turbine blades out of titanium because titanium weakens with heat. And your regular uh, turbine inlet temperature, so the temperature that the gas comes into the turbine section, is usually around 1,000 to 1,200 degrees C, or about 2,000 Fahrenheit. And titanium melts at around uh, 900, 900 C, and it starts to weaken above about 600 C. Mm. So I use titanium though for my uh, for my driver in golf though. <laughs> Stuck, uh, Stuck said earlier, I had a hot start once. I was in St. Thomas with a 30 knot wind gust shoot up the tailpipe when d uh, doing a quick turn. Ooh, ouch. Yep. Well, at least you're in St. Thomas. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that'd be... Well, I mean, not necessarily... When you see fire coming out the exhaust, you immediately shut off the fuel control. The condition mm -hmm. goes to fuel off, and you start diagnosing what the problem is. If it's a very short overtemp, it usually is survival before the engine. You might just need a quick bore scope inspection. Just check that the engine is fine. And then you can start it up again and then go get going again. 
But if it is a very bad situation, like the one that I showed you with the Agent JZ thing, obviously that engine will not start anymore. Mm. I mean, it's probably just going to be seized from the pieces going through it. And yeah, you, you're looking at a major engine overhaul, probably even a scrapping of the whole engine. So just take the parts. That's, yeah, if there are any parts to be salvaged, yeah. some uh, turbine shops will, some won't do that. And you're easily looking at a half mil uh, down the drain. So uh, the CF34, according to GE, there is no limit on tailwind. Uh, in our case, we were good. I caught it before we redlined. Whew. There you go. All right. Yep, well, yep, yep. let's continue on with the startup. So startup procedure on a PT6 is usually very, very simple, and it follows the same procedure in every turbine engine. Uh, you position so the fuel is in cutoff and you'll engage the starter. It's an electric start on the PT-6. You engage the starter. What happens at that point is that the starter generator, which is attached to the accessory gearbox, starts to spin up the engine um, up to minimum start RPM. So it's the starter uh, knob that you see there. It has three positions, so, start, mm -hmm. off, and motor. OK. It's on the side panel. Yep. And uh, that thing, so start, off, and motor, the only difference between the positions is off is obviously it doesn't, the starter is completely disengaged and uh, the engine igniters are not doing anything. Um, <coughs> then you have the start position, which engages both the starter generator motor, so the engine starts to be spun up, and then and at the same time, it engages the igniters, which are basically big spark plugs in the engine. Mm -hmm. And and you can hear it on many PT6s. You can hear sort of a click, click, click yep. going. Yep. Yep. It's a very high volt, high amp disc discharge, arc discharge starter. Very prominent uh, on the uh, the B200 and the 1900, but not so much on this one. Yep. Uh, well, it's probably just loud enough. <laughs> the engine yeah. is loud enough that yeah. you don't hear them, but they are easy to hear. Not that hard to hear, actually. Yeah. Um, so the starter will spin up the engine, but there's a limit because the, the starter is, the, there's a duty cycle limit on the starter. I think around, on most engines, it's about a minute. Uh, so you at that point, once you engage the starter, you're, you're looking for two things. You're looking to hear the clicks and you're looking at the engine RPM. So the gas generator, sometimes called NG, you're looking for that to start rising. If once the gas generator RPM start passes on PT sixes, it's mostly most usually twelve percent. Um, you can take the condition lever. So it's a two hand start, by the way. You have your left hand on the starter, mm -hmm. and then you have your right hand sitting on the condition lever. Okay. Once the gas and you're looking at the gauges, the engine gauges up at the top. Mm -hmm. Once the gas generator RPM passes twelve percent. Uh, it's uh, over the fourth gauge from the left, I think, on the on the on the caravan. I see the N2 uh, RPM percentage. Uh, yeah, and sometimes called N2, NG, GG. Doesn't really matter what it is. Or but N9, you, you, I guess. That's weird. Okay. Yep. Uh, so once that passes 12%, that's when you grab the condition lever and you shove it up into the low idle position. Okay. And notice that the that the uh, gauge has two uh, two parts. It has a 10% grady, gradation and a and a 1% gradation. The little sort of little dial in it uh -huh. that will spin up per 1%. So you'll see it'll as the big one spins up slowly. The little one will go around in circles for every 1% of RPM. Okay. That it. And we're looking for. Tw tw we're looking for 12% minimum. So this that'd uh, be 10. That would be 12 right there. Okay. Yep, it'll show past the first mark, and then the little one will show two. Okay. Oh, but, okay, I see what you're saying. 12 minimum, okay. Yep, 12 is minimum for introducing fuel. That po At that point, you'll put the uh, fuel control, the condition, into low idle. That'll open up the uh, uh, high-pressure fuel valves, and it'll start the flow of fuel into the engine. Since you've already got some air going through the engine, by the way, 12% of 39,000 is what? Uh, about 4,500 RPM. That, so that's the speed that the engine is going right at that point. Oh, um, it's NG, not N9. Yeah. Okay, NG. Sorry. Thank you, Tony. Yep. 
it's N for number, literally number of revolutions, sort of, so to speak, and G for gas generator. Okay. On uh, on many engines, it's sometimes called just turb percent, or N2 is what it's called on jets, on uh, high bypass fans. It doesn't really matter what it is. You'll, you'll, you'll know when you when you look at the gauges, you'll know which one's the uh, gas generator RPM. Okay. So past twelve percent, you, you since you've already got the igniters going and you've got already some airflow uh, airflow going through the engine, uh, that when you introduce fuel at that point, it'll catch and it'll start accelerating. Uh, usually, the starter all by itself. If you just leave the starter running, it'll go up to maybe twenty twenty five percent on a good day, depending on the on how well charged your battery is, how old the starter is, and and basically how much torture you're willing to accept to the starter. Mm. Um, so the engine will catch. It, it'll start to accelerate all of a sudden much faster. And at that point, your viewpoint shifts from just looking at the NG value. You start looking at uh, the ITT at the same time. So your, your eyes will sort of shift between the NG and the ITT. You're looking for an increase in ITT, that, which will indicate that the engine is, is lit. Sometimes you can just glance on the, on the real plane. You just glance out the window, make sure that there's no white plume coming out the tailpipe, mm -hmm. and no uh, white plume coming out the tailpipe, and no ITT rise would indicate that you're just spraying fuel down the tailpipe and mm. nothing's happening. Mm. That, at that point, you would shut it off because it means that you're you're basically saturating <laughs> the engine with fuel and nothing's litting, it, nothing's being lit. Mm. Um, but that'd be just a broken engine at that point. Um, so you'll see an ITT rise, and it'll go up pretty quickly, but it should stabilize uh, below, usually under the red line. If you've got a good starter, the engine will sort of start accelerating pretty quickly on the NG, and the ITT will sort of go up and peak somewhere below the red line. It, on the uh, caravan, I think there's a, even a second red line marker. Uh, Eight the and normal 11. Red, yeah. yeah. The normal red line marker is sort of the maximum flight temperature. And you shouldn't go above that for sustained engine operation. The 11 temperature is a one second maximum during start. So the engine could sort of, for one second, peak almost below the red line for the start limit. Yeah, it's called the ST lim for mm. 1090 10, degrees C. And it can peak below that for one second and then immediately go down. Up until that point, you're good. If, you, if it stays for long, for if it stays for more than one second above the 820 degree red line, or if it goes over the start limit maximum, at that point you got to shut the engine off and do an inspection because the engine has obviously got some problem. And so the engine, so oh, once you we got some fuel, bits come, big bits coming in. Oh, oh. oh shit! Chuckle Hut says this is cool. Learning many things. Thanks you too. And then he, uh, he, yeah, he said, love this at John Fly and guest. Very cool. Thank you, Chucklehut. This is uh, Toto Ritko. He's here in the chat. Uh, his name is uh, Sasho. And, uh, yeah, if you missed it earlier, he, he's the uh, developer of the Better Pushback plugin, Real World Pilot, and we went through a, a lengthy, healthy discussion on the inside of the PT6, and now we're going through the startup routine. But thank you for the, that's the biggest bit, I've ever had that is that's a lot of bits that's a lot of bits okay sorry go ahead uh, Sasha no worries um, I'm glad for you and thanks Chuck a lot for the generous contribution um, so once the engine lights at 12% um, you cannot shut the starter off um, the engine is too slow to actually keep on accelerating the only thing that you'll do at that point is you'll just burn up the engine because it won't be accelerating sufficiently fast. It might actually even slow down uh, if you shut the starter off. So from 12% up to what's called the minimum self-sustaining RPM, the engine still needs the help of the starter to push it up, 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 further up. Mm -hmm. And at some point, usually around 45 to 50%, you can shut the starter off. At that point, the engine has sufficient speed going through it and sufficient airflow and fuel flow that it'll keep on accelerating up to minimum RPM, which is usually somewhere around 60, 55 to 65% uh, near the bottom of the green arc. And uh, once you've shut off the starter, the engine is completely self-sufficient. It'll get up to minimum RPM, and that's where it'll sit. And from there on out, you're pretty much good to go. Um, 
most turbine engines enjoy a one minute uh, warm up time, but it's it's not strictly required. Um, That's like yeah, from most ladies. On, yeah, pretty much. Uh, Hello, really Yod, Yod, Yod78. Good morning. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's really there just to keep to get the uh, cooling oil all warmed up and and uh, well, uh, you know, running and cycling through the engine so that everything's all ready to go. But pretty much, if you need it to in a in a pinch, you could start up the engine and go to max power pretty much immediately. <laughs> so when you're re when you're ready to taxi or when you're ready uh, for takeoff. Or depending on your load, you can just shove the fuel control into the, the condition into high idle props. Make sure that make sure that you're in high RPM, mm -hmm. and yeah, from there on out, you taxi out, get up to the runway, do you all your pre takeoff checks, set your flaps. You know, uh, uh, advise your passengers of all the safety uh, of all the safety equipment and the emergency exit. You know, break a window if you gotta, and. Uh, yeah, and on takeoff, by the way, the the reason why you put uh, the uh, propeller lever into high RPM is because the engines, for most PT6s, the engines are actually capable of much more power than uh, what is sort of the rated value. So your caravan is, I think, 890 horsepower, but the actual engine is capable of more like 12 or 1400. Jeez. Uh, I know that for a B1900, its PT6 is rated at 1279 maximum continuous power, but the actual engines, the thermodynamic limit is more closely, more close to 1800 RPM. Hmm. The reason for the limitation there is because that's the maximum amount of torque at the maximum propeller RPM that the gearbox can sustain. Hmm. That's why you are... That's why when you're setting takeoff power on a PT6, you're looking at two gauges, which is the torque value, and then the ter uh, then the engine temperature, the the ITT, the inter turbine temperature. Now I understand so you why you can be full prop and it's not it's no problem because it, the engine's not really even sweating at that point. Yeah, and you you can basically set it up to all usually on fuel be limited by torque mm. by how much power. The gearbox can put through itself because before it disintegrates. If you over torque the gearbox, um, there's I think on a caravan there's a little transient value where, which you can exceed for a couple of minutes. So there's two red lines. But if you go over the upper red line, you're basically in uncharted territory. Um, who knows? Maybe you'll just hear a big bam, and all of a sudden your prop will detach from the aircraft, um, or something bad happens. But basically. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so <laughs> it's possible to over torque the engine and just have the gearbox okay, completely so let's, disintegrate. Let's uh, let's flip let's flip some switches here. So what I'm going to be doing here? So I've I've set my parking brake. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking in this case we want to have uh, a light on a beacon light of sorts. Yeah, usually beacon lights. But I would turn the master, the master on first. Sure. Yeah. Master, master battery. Beacon light on, and then I'm gonna uh, get some air conditioning sounds coming on. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put the do I, so I put the fuel boost on. Uh, not necessary. Uh, I think the fuel boost is only used in some marginal conditions, which I don't exactly know the purpose for. G I T R okay. um, done. We got a subscribe. Really Sapiens with the seven. We months. got a subscribe. Zeben. We well, got not, a subscribe. Right? Seven months. Get her done, Sapiens. Thank you, man. That's the former Three Green Gaming right there. Thanks for the support. All right, so fuel bo fuel boost is will stay on normal. Okay. Yep. And then we're gonna flip into the starter position. Um, uh, yeah. So the, as I said, the starter has three positions. What you want for start is the start position. The okay. motor position is just run the starter motor without the igniters. Uh, that is useful for when you had a hot start and you want to sort of evacuate the engine, get all the fuel out. That, at that point, you're, you'll just motor the starter for about a minute, and that will just pull a, a bunch of cold air through the engine, get it cooled down, and ready for another start if, you okay. have, if you've had a problem starting before. Keep the avionics off, obviously. Uh, normally, before flight, you would also check the voltages on the battery. Um, so there's a there's a voltage selector on the lower side lower left side of the main panel, 
and you would flip that over, I think, to... to oh, I see it, yeah. To the battery. Part. Or volt, yeah, to, okay. Yeah, we got... It, it's a combined volt amperage. Uh, yeah. So we got 24 indicator. volts. Yeah, the minimum is 24, I think, okay. for starting. Okay. Uh, it's a 24-volt battery, or 23, or something like that. That's it's basically a, something you make new sure. I've never done before. Check the volts, it's good. Yeah, because otherwise you're not just you're just not going to get anything. Uh, and uh, the uh, the uh, stuff that you're hearing, actually, is the electric gyros and the uh, attitude and uh, HSI indicators. Okay. It's not an air conditioning fan, I think. Oh, <laughs> but wow. But it does sound just... kind of... It, yeah. It does sound kind of similar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, um, so okay. ignition, we're going to do start. We want the ignition, ignition can, on. Ignition can be left in normal. That's fine. Normal, okay. Uh, ignition on is normally used, I think, for flying through adverse weather. That's, for for instance, the on a 737, it's called the continuous ignition system, which you would uh, set if you expect to fly through a lot of precipitation. And there's going to be a lot of water going through the engine. You don't want to have it extinguish your uh, combustion combustion flame. So you would set the igniters up to on, and it will continuously fire the igniters. Uh, and so if you have a flame out for whatever reason, it'll immediately catch again. All right. So if we're in in inclement weather, then that may some, be something that we we put on. Yeah, especially when flying through a lot of precip. Precip. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so at this point we got our beacon light on. I accidentally turned on turned on the landing light instead. Thanks to Dream Keys. Thank you. <laughs> um we got uh, so we're going to go into the start position and then, and then we're going to look for uh, tr uh 12 minimum 12% on the NG yes. before we add low Fuel. low idle on the condition level. Yes. Okay. Well, should we do that now? Yes. Um, I'm going to turn so the engine sound down. Yeah, it'll be pretty loud. Yep. I'm going to turn the plane down. Uh, also, I'd recommend putting the prop lever into either max RPM or feather. It's usually left in one of those. Okay, so let's let's go to feather. All right, we're in feather. It, yep. All right, I got a position here where I can watch the NG and everything at the same time so here we go awesome it'll it'll go pretty quick so uh you don't have to worry about uh catching everything at the first time you know w once you get used to what to, what to expect you'll you'll realize exactly where you want to look yeah okay so feel free to engage the starter oh I, you're behind i guess because i yeah i'm All right, so in the feather, it's probably animating the okay. feather. Yep, and it, once the engine passes 45 or 50 percent, you can shut off the starter. 45 or 50 percent. All right, it looks like it just doesn't want to stay in the. Oh, oh it's it's way past that now. <laughs> yeah. And there you go, starter complete. All right, it's, so let's look at the. Uh, So I probably want to uh, take it out of feather, those, maybe. Uh, you don't have to necessarily right now. Um, so you've got ITT is stabilized. Um, and once you take it out of feather, it'll it'll accelerate the prop. You'll see the yeah, prop Yeah, I'm RPM. still in feather. Now, apparently, um, so there, the, uh, mm -hmm. so all my gauges look good. We got... Yeah, a, another thing that in reality you would also, um, uh, it's a bug in the ignition light. Yeah, uh, I'll, that. I learned how to fix it the other day. I'll, yeah, it's a, I'll it's do a, it now. It's just a double going up to start and then start twice and then all of a sudden the, the ignition light's out. Yeah, it's it's a bug. Normally the ignition light, all, all, all that it tells you is that uh, the igniters are firing, which as soon as you position the start switch into off, then the igniters are off. So there's mm. no reason for that, the, the ignition to show. Another thing, by the way, which you check right after engine start is that you've got oil pressure. Because if you don't have oil pressure, the engine will eat up its bearings. So, um, so PSI up here then, okay. Yep, yep, yep. 
normally is it's sufficient during the engine startup if you glance on the on that gauge and you'll see that it's coming out of the zero value and it's coming up into the yellow part mm -hmm. that's when you realize that okay the engine is has the oil pump is fine we've got some oil and it's all circulating the oil pump ain't broken it's not quite as super duper important as on a piston engine where on a piston engine usually the recommendation is to have oil pressure within one or two seconds of the engine start um on a, on a turbine engine, you can sort of let it go for a couple of seconds without, even without oil, and then glance and realize that there's a problem and shut it off and it'll be fine. But you want, do want to have oil in the engine. Don't, don't yeah. make that. Don't so mistake. the mistake that I made is I had the starter on too long. What you were saying is once I get to 45% Yeah, roughly NG, 45 to 50%. I want to turn that starter off. Okay. Yeah, it's because it, it's a pretty big load. It's a 28 volt starter that draws about uh, maybe two, three hundred amps. So, uh, if you keep the starter running, you cannot engage the gener can engage the generator because it's the same thing. It's okay. a starter generator, and you're draining the battery continuously. Okay. All right. After now, so that, we want to we can turn avionics on, or what would be the uh, oh, uh, you you can now engage the generator. Generator. Okay. So we got so generator on the. On the caravan, I think it's automatic, but you can go into trip, trip, and on. Yeah, so it's on now. Yeah. Let's go trip and then on. Okay. Or reset or on, or I keep forgetting what the exact values there are. Yeah, reset and on. Reset. Yeah, basically, if the yeah, if the if the trip circuit uh, shut off the generator, uh, then a reset basically resets that trip circuit. Okay. And on is the automatic position. Once the starter is disengaged, that means you check the voltage now for on the on the voltage gauge. You'll see that your like battery is up at 28 volts. Yeah, 28 volts. Yep. That's the generator output. That means but your battery is charging. You can also check the the uh, amps on the on the battery. If I switch to the gen, is that showing amps? That or I keep forgetting. One of the, one of those is showing amps. One of those is showing volts. Yep. I keep forgetting so that what must the be exact one. volts there and then gen there. Okay. Okay. Good info. Hello, Peter Hoover. When would you That's use all. fuel boost? Um, he touched on it earlier. Go ahead again. Uh, I keep I keep forgetting what the exact usage point is for fuel boost. Um, I don't think it's really necessary on the caravan. It might be for some turbulent conditions or something because I know that the caravan's fuel is uh, is gravity fed from the wings. And apparently, uh, it's doing a fuel boost. It's just in the norm, not in the on. It's yeah. not off, so it's actually doing a, f a fuel boost of sorts. It I'll might be an automatic thing that yeah. it's boosting automatically during start. Yeah. Uh, fuel boost normally en engages on most airplanes where it is. It's, it engages in an electric boost pump, which if there's insufficient fuel pressure going to the high-pressure fuel, com fuel uh, uh, pump, then that might actually start the engine. But I keep, uh, I'm not really sure what it's used for in a caravan. All right, turn my avionics on. Sure, yeah. Now that you have all the electrics fine, you can go ahead and, and, and turn. play around with the electrical loads. All right, so we've got... Uh, is there a taxi light? I keep forgetting on this one. I don't think there is. Oh, uh, yeah, there should be. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there is. The middle. Yeah, the middle light. It's probably on the nose wheel or something. All right, for mm -hmm. taxi, um, I want to go... I can go full feather, right? You, you want to go... Oh, sorry, not RPM, full feather. So. High. Full, uh, full full prop, and yeah, then full and then I mean, the condition lever can stay low idle or can stay low or high idle doesn't really matter. Okay, and you'll hear the propeller make a very uh, significant noise as it accelerates. Yeah, I kind of have the sounds down for me, but and at this point you are in the alpha range, and you can also accelerate the engine up to high RPM, so set the fuel control up to high idle. And at that point, uh, you are in alpha range, and as soon as you let go of the brakes, the, the, the aircraft will start creeping forward. Because okay. the minimum alpha blade angle is such that the engine produces little, but it still produces some thrust. So it'll go. Uh, so be prepared. And make sure yeah, that I'm not there's even, nobody in front of you. Yeah, I've got no... It's actually an idle at power, and yeah, it's moving. Cool. And... Uh, it's if you put it down into feather, you'll actually notice that the engine, that the aircraft should stop. That's when it produces no thrust. It, it'll if you and actually it doesn't it doesn't let me go into feather with my throttle. I probably have to yeah, with your prop map. lever. I've, oh, duh, I was not thinking right. Hold on. Set the brakes. So and here we go. It. Feather. 
Yeah, you're right. It's not moving. It's feather. And of course, the animation lets you know that you're in feather. All right. Yeah, cool. because the propeller slows down. Yeah. I need more coffee. I accidentally thought the feather was on the power handle because we were talking about beta. Okay. And there's a question from, uh, hang on, from Etax99. Ethics. What about take? I think it's Ethics. ethics. I'm not sure. But yeah, go ahead. What if you what? What about, what about takeoff? On the 7.3, you have uh, them on continuous on takeoff and climb out. Yeah, so he's talking about the ignitions. Um, normally on a PT-6, you don't have to use uh, manual ignition on for takeoff. It's only if you expect adverse weather. And really, that's the point. That's the purpose of uh, why Boeing designed it the way they did on the 7.3. is because in case you have... Um, a compressor stall, a, a and some, some engines might be a little bit more prone to it. Uh, a compressor stall essentially is a disruption of the airflow through the engine's compressor section. And that usually is associated with a bunch of very loud bangs and uh, and uh, sometimes the fuel uh, flame out. And obviously you don't want to have that on takeoff. Now certain aircraft and certain engine designs are a little bit more prone to that. I know that certain jet engines, like maybe the early 7.3s, were a little bit prone to that on a very strong crosswind. Maybe if it gusts really bad, it might disrupt the, the intake and might just cause a uh, flame out. So just to make sure, Boeing just put the extra position into that uh, starter uh, knob so that you could set it up to continuously fire uh, during takeoff. Mm. But I don't think on a PT-6, I've never really seen anybody any procedure recommend that it be set to manually igniters on. Um, on, uh, for instance, on actually, I'll let me correct myself here. On the beach crafts, there is actually such a position. It's called the auto ignition. Uh, the auto ignition immediately, that is an automatic electric circuit that comes down below a certain level of engine RPM. An auto ignition arm is what you set on the uh, on the Beechcraft. So on takeoff, you would set auto ignition to arm. And once you've departed and you're, you've got sufficient clearance, you would disarm the circuit again. And same thing for approach and landing. So yeah, I guess you could use it if you wanted to. Okay, so I've been blattering on for a little bit. It, no, it's a great answer is what Ethac said was great answer. Yeah, uh, well, Lar Lars Raz says that Carinata does not simulate a hot start. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've seen people hot start these things. Uh, like, I've seen a guy take a nine Beach 1900 and uh, put the fuel control into high idle. Uh, he thought it was a mixture. Uh, turn on the starter and then shut off the starter at about 20% RPM. So he did the worst possible combination. He did the fuel while the engine was not running. <laughs> <laughs> and when the engine was below self-sustaining RPM, he shut off the start, which uh, should have automatically meant that the engine would probably spool down with a nice tailpipe fire. <laughs> they, you know, the one one of the planes that I think really models failures well with regard to engine startup is that uh, Jetstream 32. <laughs> uh, possible. That the thing... Jetstream that thing, man, that thing is so accurate. You have to be precise with that thing or you will get an uh, engine fire. It's probably too uh, realistic. My, <laughs> <laughs> it might be a little bit too peculiar about that, yeah. Um, on the, for instance, so the jet stream is actually funny. Well, funny. It's, it's a different kind of design. That one uses an engine which is not a free power turbine. So there, the power turbine and the compressor turbine are one and the same thing, and they're on the same shaft. Mm. So in that, in that aircraft, you have to have the propellers in the maximum forward position, not feather. Because if you feather the engine, if you feather the propellers, the engine will not get up to self-sustaining RPM, and during start, you'll basically burn it up. Uh, so you have to unfeather that engine. Makes and sense. Then, How do I know that, Mike? Yeah, I know that all too well. I was I, it was a mission accomplished when I actually w was able to go through a, per a proper procedure with that plane and fly around and take and not have it be in flames. It was it was a big big success. <laughs> and by the way, this procedure basically applies to all turbine engines. It doesn't really matter if it's jet engine or, or a turboprop or a turboshaft. Yeah. Um, same thing goes for for instance for the Bell 407 from Dreamfoil. 
that one's that one works in exactly the same way. If you have it in manual start mode, you also engage the starter with a button. It, you'll hear the clicks. You'll hear the engines pulling up, and then you twist the throttle up to minimum start RPM. I'm sorry, minimum fuel flow, and that you'll see, you'll hear the engine catch, and it, it'll start accelerating. And once it's up above a certain value, you can let go of the starter. Mm. So turbine helicopters. Even even jet aircraft like a seven three or a seven four work in exactly the same fashion. Now for certain things, for certain aircraft, it there's a little bit more automation. So something like the Saab three forty, uh, that one has a full authority engine control unit. So at that from for that air, for that aircraft, all you have to do is you got to basically position when you're sitting still. You just position the condition lever into the start position. And flip a switch on the overhead, and it takes care of it automatically. It does. Mm -hmm. It knows when to start the engine, when to introduce fuel, how to control if there's any problem with it. It'll automatically shut off and do all that. For I you. really, I really like the Saab quite a bit. Unfortunately, it's not compatible with my SciTech panels, and so I, I requested uh, Leading Edge. They were asking for feedback with their with their uh, update, and I said, please make it compatible with SciTech panels. And they they considered that whether or not they're going to implement that in that update, I don't know. But it's a plane I would love to fly more. But I I have three SciTech panels that I want working with it. <laughs> oh really? Oh uh, well, I mean I can help you out with that. Really? Yeah, it's like I've done custom... some work on. Oh, brilliant! See? I, I've done some work with uh, with Bill Good on X SciTech panels, and I need to publish that with him. Uh, he actually was over here. In oh, Slack, is that Sparky? Yeah. Yeah, Sparky's Bill Good. Okay. Yeah. He he was over here visiting me in Slovakia three months ago, and we were flying. Oh wow! Because he's a legend in the. Uh, I don't run his his uh, panel plug-in because, well, it's been probably nine to twelve months since I've run it. Since I had a lot of issues, oh. so I'm using just the standard driver from SciTech, and I probably am missing a lot of huh. features. Yeah. Yeah, you sold your SciTech panels because of that kind of stuff. Yeah, Adam. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm I'm running a fairly complicated software setup here that makes sure that my SciTech panels pretty much automatically switch based on what kind of airplane I want to use. But uh, my setup is really tailored to my needs, and, and I wouldn't really transfer over to anybody you, else. You will probably be able to assist me with getting certain aircraft to work more. Yeah. You know, Funny thing, it, it's kind of an it's kind of an undocumented feature, by the way, but SciTech panels allows you to have a per aircraft configuration. Oh, I didn't know that. I I didn't. Well, I know that you have the X SciTech panels profile, whatever. But yeah, but you can shove that into the aircraft folder, and it'll just pick that up only when it's running that aircraft. Oh. So you can just tailor your configuration to the particular airplane. Okay, we have to talk more. Unfortunately, I'm going to probably take a lot of your time over the next few months in, in tweaking my that that and many other things. It's like uh, it's unbelievable the amount of tech support that we actually do live, but it it the 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 amount of tech support that happens on the YouTube side of things it's crazy. It's like it's almost like people. Well, some people just won't Google anything, and then some people are. It, it's a great avenue to teach multiple people how to fix certain things this that and the other so if you're watching this on youtube and you know later on this week come join us live for live technical support <laughs> all right so on the startup routine um we got we've gone through the startup routine i'm at, i'm 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 lined up and and waiting on the runway i've turned on my yep. landing lights got my nav my strobe my taxi light is off i'm gonna pedo heat's not needed where it's uh 70 some odd degrees Fahrenheit. Um, yeah. As far as the takeoff roll, what do I, I don't want to, what am I looking Normally, for? Normally, primarily gonna... what you're looking for is two gauges, which is, so initially when you're sitting there on the brakes, as you advance the power, you'll see the engine RPM come up, I'm sorry, the prop RPM come up, and it'll go into the green band, and, it'll, and what you're looking for is that it'll stabilize at your 2000 RPM value. So you've got propeller set to max RPM right now, so you expect 2,000, and you, wa you want to see the engine to stabilize around that value and not go beyond 2,000, because otherwise you know that you've got a, a constant speed unit failure. So but, you basically... So 2,000 on the... On the... Uh, to, on, the uh, on the prop the RPM. The first... Or the prop RPM, because that's... Oh, the prop RPM. But, but 2,000 is the very end. How would you know if it goes beyond yes. it? 
Uh, the 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 actual needle can go past it. Oh. That's just where the so we can go beyond the red, but stay below the twenty. Yep. Okay. All right. Actually, I think it'll stabilize around the red value. I, don't, I keep forgetting if it's two thousand or nineteen fifty or something. What the maximum RPM, RPM is for the okay. for the uh, for the caravan. Each aircraft is different. All right. So I'm going to advance the throttles. Uh, we're going to look for uh, around twenty, and then we're going to. So uh, at that point, you know that the that the propeller has gone into governing mode, and that the prop governor has engaged. So it'll start controlling the pitch of the blade at the angles. Chuckle Hut says, what was the ITT gauge measuring again? It's the inter-turbine temperature. So as I explained, there are two turbines in the engines. There's uh, the compressor and the, the power turbine. And ITT just means that there's a thermocouple that's stuck, uh, shoved in between these two. Uh, there's another kind of value. So you have the TIT, or the TIT, but that's the turbine inlet temperature. That would mean that the thermocouple is before the first compressor turbine. So it's right at the very end of the combustor. Mm. And then you also have sometimes what's called the TOT, or also commonly called the EGT, the exhaust gas or turbine outlet temperature. And that's that's past the last turbine. It really doesn't matter where it is. Point is that the engine designer uh, put, your ga put the gr little green band on your engine gauge and calibrated it to where the, they know that the engine will survive. So it really doesn't matter what it says. All that matters is it's a temperature gauge and keep it in the green. Mm. Okay. All right. Do you happen to know offhand what the rotation speed is for the uh, caravan? Caravan's about 80 to 90 knots um, with no flaps. With flaps, it's around 80 knots. Something that I saw uh, in a, in a real-world world video is that they rarely use flaps on takeoff in the caravan. It really it depends was, on how. I think it was Stevo that said they rarely yeah, use you, flaps. Yeah. If you if you're not very heavily loaded and you've got plenty of runway. Uh, feel free to ignore flaps and just go 85 uh, but, or 90. But maybe rotate. if he's at one of those short Bahamian fields. Yeah, then you would normally use. Or if you've got soft field, soft where you want to limit the amount. Yeah. We want to limit limit the amount of abuse that the landing gear is getting. All right. Uh, I've set the altimeter. I'm just going to go ahead and take off. Sure. We're going to look so for. So you're up at the prop governor. Then you can start advancing the power lever up until reaching sort of the top end of the torque band. And you'll also glance at the temperature gauge, make sure it doesn't go over the red line. Temperature so the gauge band, is the ITT. ITT. The third one. The third one, okay. And we don't want that to go into the red, okay. Yeah, you it, want to keep it preferably uh, in the green. For this demonstration, uh, I'm going to zoom in a little further sure. into the. Uh, Oh, it helps if you have. Because yeah, it, it it's helps hard to if read from way back. For that. Yeah. yeah. It helps to have if you have a view that only shows the airspeed indicator and the uh, and the dials, the engine dials. Mm. And so you're advancing torque uh, pretty much to keep it within, just below the red line within the green band. So that is basically your maximum torque, the maximum amount of energy that your engine can deliver, uh, while not over temping and not over torquing. Okay, so I'm a little bit above red line. I'm not watching my steering. You just glance at these numbers. Nor you'll ultimately, in the end, you'll uh, learn exactly where you want to keep them. And once the engine is set, then you're happy. Just leave it as it is and, and watch yeah. your airspeed and just fly the aircraft. All right, once so... Once in the air, yeah. you want to gently depress the brakes to stop the engines from the wheels from spinning. Okay. It's kind of a habit that you pick up as a real-world pilot because in the real airplane, if you keep the engine spinning, you'll get a very strong shutter through the airframe. Okay. All right, we're going to do a little maneuver here. Oh, we must have the, the customary outside flyby view. Of course. Otherwise, the thing doesn't even fly. <sighs> All right, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and level off here at 1,000 because I'm going to probably just do a, a little pattern. But um, we'd probably come back off of the power lever. Yeah, keep it uh, keep it uh, a little bit within the green band. For climb, obviously, you would keep it close to the edge of the green band. 
uh, for a cruise, you can just set it to wherever you need for the speed you want. All right, Skipjack said something there. What, what did he say? I missed it. Uh, I'll uh, I'll advise thing to do in an ASK one, ASK twenty one. That's a glider tapping the brakes. Them being at the end of the air brake traverse travel. Hmm. Well, never flown a glider, so I'll take a Skipjack at his word. And yeah, uh, Mikey sixty one. If 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 you just just go full power on this thing, you are almost guaranteed to break the engine to pieces. Uh, but yeah, um, so just set the power wherever you you want it for the speed that you want and cruise. Uh, trick on the turbo props is as you climb up, especially on the PT six, which doesn't have an actual engine control. As you climb up, the air thins out, and so you'll see that the uh, torque will actually start to go down. Uh, so the so what you want to do at that point is provided that you're not at the temperature limit you can start advancing the power further and further up to keep the torque up. So you're basically just using more of the engine's thermodynamic range to give you more power or to keep the power basically the same during the climb. Now, at some point, you will run out of either torque range or, uh, I'm sorry, at some point you will run out of uh, temperature range, for instance, that so that there's not enough cooling air going through the engine anymore that you cannot advance power anymore. That's At that point, you are thermally limited on the engine and you cannot uh, keep on adding power. Or another possibility is that you just run out of, if, if it's a very cool day, and if there's uh, enough cooling air going through the engine, uh, then you'll just run out of uh, engine RPM. So you, even you know, though you will have your torques, I'm sorry, you will have your power lever all the way up to the max, uh, the engine will just not give you any more power. That means that at that point, you are just limited by the maximum power of the engine that it can deliver at that altitude. So mm -hmm. at that point, you have reached the critical altitude of the engine, that your max power altitude. Now, for most turbine engines, it's pretty high up. It's usually around 15 to 20,000 feet. But there will be a value that, at which point the engine will start to be limited by uh, ooh, low pass. Mm -hmm. Checking the wrong way for obstacles, I guess. Exactly. Thermodynamics in a John Fly stream, yes. Yeah. Hello, Tim Rodeo, yes. he's He's got several names. We love them uh, all. Uh, S. Kisilkov is just my full name, so it's Sasha Kisilkov. Uh, and that's I use that because I collaborate on some other things uh, up on GitHub, uh, on some other projects where it's normal, it's common to use your real name for. <laughs> yeah. I'm finding that it's common to use your real name for a lot of things. Like, for example, in iRacing, I have to use my real name. On Vatsim, I have to use my real name. Yeah, pilot as well. Nope. You don't have nope. to on pilot edge. No, it's a little little uh, unknown thing that you can request to be anonymous. You can't change your name, but you can request to be anonymous. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so, Lars asks, asks uh, so you only reduce power lever and cruise and never touch the prop RPM. Uh, normally, it really depends on how... Um, so the prop RPM, really what it does it, is it changes the noise profile of the engine inside the cabin. If you are bothered by the 2,000 RPM, the high screech of the engine, you can reduce it. That's fine. It's not a thunder uh, screech, though. It's not a thunder screech. It won't actually tear your insides out. Uh, but uh, Goldsy, hello. Thunders. Everyone rock the Goldsy emote right now. <laughs> well, those of you who uh, can rock the Goldsy emote. It's common to reduce it and cruise to sort of cut down on the noise of the engine because it's really... The 2000 RPM can be a little bit ear splitting if you listen to it for hours and hours on end. But uh, at that point, you have to realize that as soon as you reduce uh, RPM of the propeller, the engine can still produce the same amount of energy, the same amount of power. And if you listen, if you remember back to your physics courses, power is RPM times torque. So, in order to get the same amount of power through the gearbox, you would have to produce more torque. 
consist gearbox can take only so much torque and at some point it'll just lose all its teeth uh, your little gear gears will come flying out of the gearbox to get maximum power for takeoff and landing that's why you keep your engine at max and high rpm uh, or the propeller basically you keep it at, at the maximum rpm that it can sustain in order to be able to push as much energy through the propeller and as much thrust out of the engine in case you need it for a go around or in case you're very heavy on takeoff and you want to shorten your takeoff roller or something or for, for instance you have obstacles you run into like a flock of birds and you want to get the last amount of climb performance out of the engine as you can if uh once you've departed and you've got sufficient ground clearance yeah sure go ahead reduce the uh reduce the prop rpm but realize that as you reduce prop rpm you'll see the engine torque actually come up because the engine is still producing the same amount of energy but in order to put that energy into the propeller which is now spinning slower it, the gearbox has to conduct more torque so you might actually hit the torque limit and you, you're going to have to start reducing engine rpm um, you're going to have to start reducing engine power so lower lower prop rpms translate into less uh less thrust effectively which might be fine for cruise but not really what you want for takeoff or climb let's see and i hope i haven't put any, everybody asleep no this is such good information the unfortunate part is that i have to go back and watch the vod over and over and over again to catch all of the the tidbits because it's such good information but without uh, repetition, my mind doesn't doesn't grab all of it. But I sure, think I, I think that snores loudly. I think that I can. Um, I think that I can uh, review that 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 startup procedure and be a little more accurate. And then I'm also qualified to look at other streams and say, hmm, exactly, he's doing it wrong, <laughs> or she's doing it wrong, or they're doing it right, or they're she's doing it right. Yeah, so if you if, actually, if you uh, with this information, if you look at one of Stevo's streams where he starts up uh, either the TBM or the car Caravan, both of them use the same engine, the PT6, um, you'll see that he does exactly what I've told you in exactly the sequence that I've told you about. Mm. And you'll see them, uh, sometimes he zooms in on the gauges and you can actually see the gauges behave in exactly that way. Mm. So that from there on, you will understand exactly what's happening with the engine and what's 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 going on inside of it. <laughs> and then sometimes you can actually look at some startups. So I've, like I've seen, there's a very funny video. Uh, let me actually to you. <laughs> uh, when, when do I introduce fuel on a caravan? Oh, didn't you see it? We introduce it at, uh, after 12 percent on the NG. Is he testing me? He's testing me. Possibly. Oh. Well, Oh, let me let me actually whisper you a, a funny video which you can look at um, once we're stopped and done taxing or something. <laughs> there you can see what happens if the if the fuel control goes a little bit haywire and it starts introducing too much fuel, or there's not enough R engine RPM, <laughs> and that's basically what a hot start looks like. Okay, you whispered me the link. Yeah, I whispered you the link. I'm just, I've been given permission to take a tour of the terminal. This is the new, uh, a new scenery for the John Fly pit. It's Baltimore. Yeah, I'm looking at it. It's looking pretty good. Pretty yeah. solid. Yeah. I like the, the different Southwest liveries. We got the Arizona one. We got the, uh, what one's that yellow one? Southwest. I've never oh, seen the that's one New with Mexico. Great. Yeah, I've never seen the one with the gray band going down the side. No. Oh, there's Texas. I didn't even know that they had uh, they had different ones based on state. Yeah, I never I didn't know they had a New Mexico one. Uh but I've known I have in fact if you in fact I'm just gonna make a Oh, this will be fun. I'm going to do this. I'm going to stop right here. Um, so if you look on stream, here is the California state livery for Southwest. 
It's not a very good... F I gotta get a better webcam. There's the, the model, the one 500 scale model. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, Arizona. Mikey was asking which airport is this. I think this is Baltimore, yep, you said, right? Yep, this is BWI, yep. One of my favorites is the uh, Shamu. The Shamu livery. Wow, almost looks like a Japanese rising sun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the one with Arizona, yep. So, yeah. Mr. X short.